call this old meeting to James City County Board of Supervisors business meeting to order on January 24, 2023 at 1 p.m. Mr. Stevens, would you call the roll, please, sir? Ms. Sadler? Here. Mr. Eisenhower? Here. Mr. McGlennon? Here. Ms. Larson? Here. Mr. Hill? Here. All right, I need a motion to amend the agenda to add the James City County audit presentation as item number four under the presentation and to add an additional closed session item for attorney's advice regarding proposed amendment to A1 and A8 zoning district. Motion. Motion. All right. Mr. Stephen, you call the roll, please, sir. Uh, Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Ripple? Aye. Motion carries. All right. Next, we'll go into presentations. Ms. Boone. <laughs> She's like, oh, no. I don't want to come up. Look. <laughs> <laughs> Chairman Hipple, members of the board, Grace Boone, General Services Director, and it's always a pleasure to be here talking about someone's uh, time with James City. So, you know, Tina Creech is our um, uh, inspection supervisor. Uh, she's with the Stormwater and Resource Protection Division, is retiring after 16 years and 10 months um, at James City County and over 30 years of um, experience in the construction field. She started with James City in 2006 as an environmental inspector in the Engineering and Resource Protection Division. And then she became the lead inspector in 2017. And that same year was awarded the General Services Employee of the Year. That, don't ever forget that. I won't. I'll never forget <laughs> that. I don't think you'd ever let me forget no, that. I will not. I appreciate, yeah, I appreciate that too. Um, she, <laughs> she was promoted to inspection supervisor in March 2021, and Tina previously worked for VDOT in the construction field, and her prior experience made her invaluable to the team. Tina has been a tremendous resource and a leader to, in the division for many years. She spent countless hours during normal work hours, and I would say in not normal work hours, yes. on construction sites, on the phone, and in meetings with contractors and engineers. In order to protect water quality, she also worked um, to train new staff on erosion and sediment control and stormwater management issues and established division SOPs for the inspection staff. Tina has received numerous compliments from private citizens, HOAs, and the development community in her ability to assist them through construction-related problems. Her above and beyond attitude wasn't only for external customers, but also her coworkers who she is always willing to help. Her last goal with JCC was to ensure that the existing inspection staff was fully trained and able to operate at a high level in her absence. Um, there is no way to accurately quantify the contributions that Tina has made to the department and to the division and to James City County she would be greatly missed, but we wish her the best as she enjoys her hard-earned, well-deserved retirement. Thank you. Thank you. No, no speech, but we would like to present you. We would you like with to your... present you. Oh, is it gold? All of your hard work has this huge pin. Oh, gosh. <laughs> wow, thank you. I'd like to present you this. Thank oh. you for it, and hope you enjoy your retirement. I am. And thank you for all the work you did, not only for Jane City County, but for me personally and the company when we would You're do something. You're a little hard headed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 I said, I know I can put this in. Somebody besides me says But thank you yes. for all your hard yes. work and, and dedication and all the work you did with us at the company and what you do with James City County. If I could ask the board to come up sure. and do a picture. Awesome. And would you yes. like to say anything before I get the board down? I just want to say I work for another agency before here. I wasn't going to name them, but VDOT. And I would like to say, <laughs> <laughs> I like to say until I came here, I, I no longer felt like a number. And I Great. love working for James City. Good Thank place. you for everything y'all have done. Thank you. Can you mute the projector? Can you mute the projector?
Next on our presentations is the Port of Virginia. And um, if I could ask Ms. Nelson to come forward. Or, yeah, I've got... I'll just um, say thank you for the opportunity to be with you today, and I'd like to introduce my colleague, Chris Gullickson, uh, who will be presenting. Uh, but I'm Barbara Nelson, Vice President of Development and Transportation Policy at the Port. Enjoy the opportunity to work with James City County uh, and your regional, as part of your regional partners and with your staff. And um, look forward to the present. Thank you. Now it's Barbara and you hopped off. Like, this is, that's all right. You know, I, tricks on. No. <laughs> we can do it each other. We can, we can, go. and uh, what a lead in. Congrats to the uh, James City County employee team has already left, but that's awesome. Uh, what a testament to the county and that remark she made. So uh, kudos to the leadership here. Thanks again. I'm Chris Gollickson. Really a pleasure to be here in, in, in front of the Board of Supervisors. And, you know, Barbara and I come today to really uh, talk about some of the exciting opportunities uh, that have happened, but more importantly, the opportunities that we have in front of us here as a community, as a region, and as the Commonwealth. So the Port of Virginia, I thought, what I just want to give you the landscape of what, you know, you hear this term, the Port of Virginia, sort of ambiguous. Uh, is that all ports here in Virginia? What is that? Well, really, the Virginia Port Authority, or as we call it, the Port of Virginia, is made up of six terminals spread throughout the Commonwealth. We have four terminals that reside down in the Hampton Roads Harbor. Two of those facilities are container handling facilities, meaning they only move ocean shipping containers. And something you should all be very proud of, their most automated, advanced container handling facilities in all of America, really, are here in Virginia. We also have a facility that handles brake bulk, so like vehicles, um, cars, electrical transformers, stuff that doesn't go in a shipping container, goes through Newport News Marine Terminal, so in between the, the coal piles there on 664 and the, the shipyard, uh, that little sliver of 115, 160 acres is the port's uh, Newport News Marine Terminal. And then probably in some of the headlines you've seen in our region, in our community, around Portsmouth Marine Terminal, and that we are repurposing to be what is a leading marshalling, staging, and loadout harbor to support offshore wind. And there's a lot of excitement around there. And I won't touch too much on that, but that is something that, again, for Virginia having really advanced container handling ports, we're also going to have one of the best ports on the entire East Coast to support a whole new form of electrical energy that's going to be generated off the coast of the U.S. And so that's something also Virginia is very proud of and something that we're going to take a leadership role in. And then we have two inland facilities, one on the James River, as I've already talked to a, a, a member here in the audience, thinking about vessels going up and down the James River. As you re can recall, there were shipping container vessels that would transit the river years ago. Uh, today, the Richmond Port, which is now called the Richmond Marine Terminal, is actually serviced by a tug and barge. And so we do run that uh, operation up there in Richmond, as well as manage the barge that transits the James River three to four times a week up and back. So that's a, a great facility. And then finally, we have a facility in Front Royal, Virginia. It's an inland port. So that's a rail port. There are no vessels calling uh, Front Royal, Virginia there off of Route 66, but it is an inland rail port and one that's uh, been around for well over 30 years and has really shown how ports can really drive the economy and not just the cargo and the activity, but the, really the investments and the jobs for the citizens, and we've seen that up in Front Royal. How is the Port of Virginia structured? How are we different? Well, through the pandemic, uh, we've, we thought about a lot of things, and we coined uh, something during the pandemic called the Virginia model, because in the Commonwealth, we are a little bit different than other ports. You know, New York, New Jersey, they're a landlord port, meaning they own the real estate, but they have third parties that come and actually run it. Uh, that's the same way on the West Coast. You'll have operators that'll lease land from a city of Long Beach or a city of Los Angeles to run the port. But really, in our case, we're very much a vertically integrated structure where the Commonwealth of Virginia uh, either owns or leases the container facilities that we run. We also have an operating arm called Virginia National Terminals. They enter into the actual contract with our labor. Uh, they also market and sign the agreements we have with the shipping lines. We have technology. Because we have automation, we're aggregating lots of data. And that data is something that we're able to work with our customers, the actual shippers, the people that own the contents, and provide additional value. And if something that's not too technologically advanced, the chassis. I mean, this is like the most simple piece of the supply chain, but was one of those first links in the chain to break during the pandemic. And those are the wheels that the containers go on. So when you're up on 64 and you see uh, the containers transiting down the highway, many times the, the chassis that is there underneath the container 
is one of our chassis. We run a fleet of about 20,000 chassis called the Hampton Roads Chassis Pool. And again, that doesn't seem like a big deal, but to our customers, especially when all the warehouses were full and all the ports were full and they didn't have any chassis because they couldn't find them, we had them. And so that another value we could provide to our customers. And it's what's made us really successful as we continue to, to grow and, and, and recover. Location. And that's something I think uh, our region, and in this community in particular, uh, what a great location. James City County is so fortunate to be right here, you know, within close proximity to our state capital, down to the, the ocean fronts of Virginia Beach and Norfolk. Um, you know, it all it's about location. And that's really for the port, too. I mean, the Commonwealth and the Port of Virginia have an ideal mid-Atlantic location. And when we were out in the marketplace talking to companies that are going to use the port and invest here in Virginia, location is one of those discussions and items that come up quite frequently. You know, most people don't realize, you know, two-thirds of our U.S. population, they live east of the Mississippi River. And that's really what this map here kind of demonstrates, just the reach that the Port of Virginia has to over 100 million people here in our country. And that's, that's something that's not lost on any of us. Um, it will continue to be a strength that can't be replicated uh, out in the marketplace. So how did we do? Well, we're fortunate here we stand today on the 24th of January. We've reported our annual figures for this past calendar year, and it was a record year. Um, most ports all had a record year last year. There's no secret there. But in Virginia, we continue to see significant growth. In fact, handling 3.7 million uh, TEUs. That's maybe the one jargon I'll throw out there. It's the measurement in which we count our containers. So it's a 20-foot equivalent unit is what the acronym TEU stands for. And we moved 3.7 million of those uh, through the Port of Virginia in calendar year 2022. It's about a 5% uh, increase. So really, really proud of that. Uh, that's something, a lot of hard work. Uh, organizationally, we still operate at best-in-class service from a, a turn time. Again, when a truck comes into our facility, we're committed to doing that, that transaction in less than an hour. We're doing that. We do it in less than 40 minutes because, again, it's about automation, technology, and being an advanced port. And so as we continue to grow, we have not deteriorated in our service. And you can imagine in the marketplace, that's important. People know that. Customers that we have appreciate that, and there are more people uh, looking to come to Virginia for just that reason. I'm going to stand here in James City County without recognizing some of our biggest customers. In fact, our biggest customer. Uh, they operate a, wa a wonderful 3 million, square foot, uh, 3 million square foot facility, obviously, in the county, uh, in the southern part of the county. But it's not just about moving contents and, and stuff that we all pick up at the local retailer. You know, it's stuff that, you know, you pick up the local furniture store or, or food products that we consume. And, and so it's, it's solely not just containers with finished products coming in and going out, but it's also inputs into a manufacturing process. And so I think, I think of, you know, even though La Tienda brings in, you know, finished meats, they're doing quite a bit here in the county, or if it's um, Anheuser-Busch InBev and, and they're uh, wonderful facility here in the county. Um, they're great customers of the port, ones that we've had for a long time, and, and we'll continue to, to have close relationships and hope that they continue to grow uh, for all parties that are involved in handling their business. Our investments don't stop. We've invested, as a Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, well over a billion dollars over the past uh, 10 years in, in the port facilities, and that investment can't stop because we are continuing to grow this port, both on the land side and the water side. And I want to touch on, on two of these four images we have up there uh, on the screen. Uh, the one on the top left is a dredger out there in the Hampton Roads Harbor. Most of us uh, maybe know or don't, but you know we are very fortunate to have a deep <coughs> shipping channel. We have deep water, 50 feet in and out of this harbor. And it really is the deepest almost on the East Coast. Charleston's at 52 feet for the time being. That's going to change, and I'll show you. Uh, but ultimately, we've always had a deep port. A lot of that's a, a contributed to the coal trade, you know, going back in, in the late 80s, um, we, we dredged this harbor to 50 feet. Um, at that time, the coal vessels that call in Newport News or in Norfolk required that. Um, we don't do coal at the, our facilities. Again, we handle containers and um, finished goods. But we've now been able to really take advantage of that deep water because the industry has adapted and the ships are getting bigger. And so we're dredging and we're spending uh, quite a bit of money, $330 million and that's a federal state type project where there's a federal match uh, to bring our channel deeper and wider. We're also investing on terminal because ultimately we are uh, the footprint we have. We have to be wise and in intentional 
to make sure that we're getting the maximum utilization out of the footprint of our facilities. And the way we do that is through our automation. So we're investing in more automation and capacity at North NIT. And then I mentioned the offshore wind um, at PMT. That's a, a huge project that Dominion and Siemens Gamesa are part of. And then rail is a big piece of what we do as well. It's not all truck. I know, you know, sometimes maybe that's all we see. But in fact, when we think of our mix of how we move freight in and out of this port, almost a third of our business is going onto the rail. And that's critical because it enters into markets like Chicago, Columbus, Kansas City, Louisville, um, all very rich areas that have a lot of cargo that we can service efficiently through the Port of Virginia uh, into those uh, inland corridors. So I mentioned the dredging. There's, there's our wonderful harbor. We have the natural deep water. Uh, you know, one of the largest natural harbors really anywhere is right here uh, in the Commonwealth in the Hampton Roads Harbor. But real quickly, I'll walk you through uh, this, this map and rendering. You know, coming out of the Atlantic Ocean, it's a 59-foot um, trough or cut into the 56-foot into the uh, Chesapeake Bay Harbor. The depth's a big deal because these big, mega, massive container ships that you see, you know, they do draw 47, 48 feet of water. But subsequently, they're also very wide. And that's where one of the challenges that we're addressing that is going to be difficult for other folks to address is the width of our channel. Um, in fact, today, when we have an ultra-large container vessel, so these are ships that are 1,200 feet long, laden with maybe 15,000 containers, um, which we have one today at VIG, so it, it happens routinely, frequently. It does limit two-way transit of commercial traffic or military traffic in our harbor when we're bringing or ultra-large container vessels leaving the Port of Virginia. So it's critically important that we're dredging to open that up to eliminate any restriction, and also to go deeper because the ships are getting larger. I mean, I think most of us saw uh, maybe 18 months ago or 24 months ago um, the ship that was stuck in the Suez Canal, the Ever Given, which is a very f important trade lane in our, our world's economy. And uh, that vessel was, you know, one of the largest on the seas. And I'm not saying by any means standing here today to say that something of that size is coming to Virginia tomorrow, but we have to be ready. This is, this is a project that take decades, um, and we're equipping uh, our harbor and our channel to be able to take and receive the largest vessels that are out there on the waters today. And that's really exciting and something that, again, is, is hard to replicate, giving Virginia a real advantage. Just to see how do we compare, because people always like to see, well, maybe I've been to Savannah and I was walking down, the, you know, and I saw a ship come by there in downtown Savannah. Well, Savannah's at, you know, 47 feet. Um, you know, Charleston's at 52, and uh, Baltimore's at 50. But Virginia, at 50 today, we're going to 55, and that'll be finished uh, into 2025. So now it'll be the deepest, will be the widest uh, on the entire East Coast, and that's, that's a big deal. I mentioned the $650 million at uh, North, uh, Norfolk International Terminals. The north end of that facility is being optimized, so we're taking the same automation that we have, and the automation is really found in the yard. It's the way we move containers within the yard space. So there's still an individual working the ship to shore crane. That's the big crane in the sky moving the container off the vessel and onto the terminal. And then it's still being moved by a piece of equipment uh, that's manned from the, the dock into the yard. But once it gets to the yard is really where the magic happens because they're all densely stacked, uh, very close to each other, and they're all being serviced by rail-mounted gantry cranes with really an operator who is set back in an office building in a climate-controlled workspace and interacting with the equipment only during the last, we'll call 20 feet, of the movement when the container is actually put onto the chassis. When the boxes are moving in the yard, we call that uh, management, yard management. It's all being done autonomous. There's no actual interaction by human. So it's a very safe, efficient, so our, our contraptions run in 24-7. It's, it's amazing that, you know, what we're doing, and that is uh, constant, taking either exports that came in that day and moving them closer to the water because the boat's coming tomorrow, or vice versa. That customer that we're so thankful to have here in James City County is coming to pick up 1,000 containers that came off the ship today, and we've got to have them right there at the front of the stack for them tomorrow morning. We're doing that, and that's based on some technology that run in the yard, an appointment system that we run for our customers, and, and really being a fluid, fluid operation. And this is also the outcome, just to put up, you know, where does that leave the Port of Virginia? Because I can't believe it's 2023, 2027 is right around the corner. You know, we stand back and look, okay, once we finish NIT uh, north optimization, having already finished south, 
uh, puts us at about a 5.4 million uh, TEU capacity. If we were to go back a few slides, you saw we did 3.7 million. So we've got some continued room to grow. That's important in the marketplace to make sure our customers, existing and future, know that we can uh, continue to handle more volume. Um, and, and ultimately, it's about improving the flow of goods. I mean, that's the thing I think COVID has exposed is uh, deficiencies in the supply chain, as we've all dealt in our lives with missing certain things um, because of delays. And, and with what we're doing from a technology, infrastructure, ability, and capacity, it's going to add that fluidity and, again, supporting growth here uh, in the Commonwealth and for businesses. I want to touch on a few James City County investments that are driven by the port. Obviously, uh, uh, Navion, who's a tankless uh, hot water heater manufacturer from South Korea, Seoul. Um, they uh, now have the facility there, the former lumber liquidators, former John Deere uh, facility there. Um, and, and that's a really exciting project, one that was very competitive, uh, one that isn't just, again, it's not just finished goods and, and containers. These are components coming into a manufacturing process and providing good quality jobs for, uh, for the citizens here of James City County. And then in light development, who uh, an entry into our market out of Jacksonville, Florida, uh, they are uh, very uh, active here in the Hampton Roads area as they're uh, constructing a speculative warehouse uh, there at Green Mountain Industrial Park. Uh, 340,000 plus uh, 373,000 square foot facility. Um, this is a group that has over 40 years of industrial development experience. Uh, they're a newer uh, group where they've recently established themselves, I think, in the past five years. But they bring a, a tremendous bench strength and a group that we're working with on a routine basis throughout this region and really throughout the Commonwealth uh, as they look to capture opportunities here in the market to develop a new high-quality Class A industrial space. But the end date's about jobs. I mean, I mean we, can, we can bring the volume and we can create uh, the investment, but I think we all take pride in knowing these things equate to new jobs. Coming out of the pandemic, um, things have changed. We don't, you know, who would have thought everything we ordered through our phone? I think we all have really appreciated e-commerce and the ease, but things are changing. So there are certain segments uh, of our economy that are adjusting and have, uh, have adjusted probably forever and other parts that have grown. And I think when we look at Hampton Roads and, and just looking sort of a COVID over recovery period, you know, transportation and warehousing is one of those segments where you saw some of the most, some of the largest job growth here in the region, where you saw, you know, obviously contraction throughout most industry outside of uh, supply chain um, and, and transportation. Sometimes, uh, and, and this is a national, just to give you national projections, it's not just, uh, hey, people are now going to Amazon. Nationally, the projection is that supply chain, transportation, warehousing, job functions will continue to grow. And just like our port has a lot of automation, as I explained, you know, the technology that's involved, the warehouse is, is the same as well. I mean, it, I, I, it's not that we kind of joke, it's not your grandfather's warehouse. It's not just a forklift and a pallet jack these days. There's automation and technology being integrated into warehouses today uh, that requires a different skill set. So yes, there are a lot of different job functions from your entry uh, limited skill set coming in, Obviously, the upside is tremendous because of the new technology, opportunities for advancement, and, and just ability for someone to work. The supply chain and transportation provide that to the individuals. Um, and so to see how much growth potential uh, is in this industry segment is something that uh, I think we should all take advantage of since the opportunity is in front of us. And then sometimes misnomer, well, they don't pay well. You know, the transportation warehousing jobs, those are not really good paying jobs. Um, well, I can tell you that has also has changed. And there's some of it's the uh, Amazon effect. That's real. Um, um, but it's, it's other companies realizing that, you know, you do have to uh, have an inc pay what you get for. You get what you pay for. And uh, the supply chain and these jobs, because of the skill set and the skill requirement, this, the wage rates have also um, adjusted accordingly. And so it's almost 90% because uh, manufacturing obviously pays higher. Um, that's, that's not a question. But it's almost about 90% parity um, is, is what right now in this region that transportation and warehousing is paying compared to uh, the jobs in the manufacturing uh, segment. I'll talk a little bit about workforce development and what we're doing here in the community. Uh, obviously, um, without people, none of this happens. Uh, we are uh, a very active corporate citizen, both with the uh, um, Peninsula uh, 
it's no longer Thomas Snell, it's Virginia Peninsula Community College, it takes me a while to get that one, I apologize, um, where you know, we're involved and engaged with their workforce development training programs. We also have a board seat on the Hampton Roads Workforce Council um, and, and working with those folks. Uh, we do stuff uh, you know, down the peninsula, uh, further down the peninsula with Achievable Dreams um, there in Newport News. And then also here in the county, you know, we also run a maritime incident response team, which actually uh, sits in the division that Barb and I reside in, in public affairs. And they're supporting all the water uh, front communities of Hampton Roads and really throughout the Commonwealth in that marine incident response. And so we actually have two colleagues who solely focus on that and they support James City County Fire and Rescue in circumstances where uh, there's an issue like maybe a lost, a lost kayaker or something that is maritime related. We have assets which are really controlled by us and then with our partners at the counties and, and cities, uh, we're able to deploy those assets in the case of an emergency. And that's something that uh, it's hard to put a, a value on it, but when you really see the impact that our assets can have to a situation from just providing a centralized command center or whatever other resources we have available, um, it's something that is, is there to be used and it is amazing what the work these guys are doing. And then finally, I just want to close it out. Um, the Port of Virginia has made a statement about decarbonization. Uh, we are doing our part uh, to drive to a zero uh, carbon emission environment. We're fortunate in that the sim automation that I've described in the yard actually is electrified already. And so we have a real a leg up there because we've already removed quite a bit of, of uh, carbon-based diesel equipment out of our operation. Uh, but we continue to strive and in fact, we're going to be uh, securing all of our port electricity from clean energy by 2024. We've already entered into those purchase power agreements with both Dominion Energy and then up in Front Royal, there's an electric co-op that we, uh, we deal with. And we've, we have those agreements in place and we'll continue to implement technology to replace uh, those carbon emitting uh, pieces of equipment as technology also uh, advances itself. So we've got a couple we call them yard tractors. Uh, that we're using right now that are electrified. We have four of those right now, kind of just running, again, in parallel with standard equipment to sort of feel like, how, how can you break them? Because it's an industrial waterfront environment. It's tough. We are tough on equipment. That's not a question. Anyone who's on the waterfront would tell you how tough they are just on uh, the equipment. So we're, we're being very mindful and tactical, but we are driving to that 2040. And that's going to be, I think, not only important to our community and, and our, our state, but to the companies we serve as well. Um, you know, these uh, large corporations have made very uh, strong commitments and those Amazons, Walmart, Target, Home Depot, Lowe's of the world, um, and we will help support them in their supply chain by greening our efforts to help them green their supply chain. I went a little long and I apologize. I do appreciate everyone's time. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Questions for Chris? Not really a question, just a, a comment. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, everybody appreciates the uh, the way in which uh, we're planning for the future and uh, to become more competitive with uh, our uh, other ports across the eastern seaboard. Uh, so uh, appreciate that that hard work. Yes, just thank you. I I um I shared with you that I'd been down there with my Sorensen class many years ago, and you said that you had offered to Mr. Stevens an invitation for us to come down, which I think would be very important because I think it is. Um, it's fascinating um, to, to watch the technology at work and to see it's, it's the picture doesn't do it justice. Oh, and, I'm sorry. Um, the, I wish I could do better, but yeah, and, we'd um, love to have you come visit. So, um, and yes, I just appreciate your efforts to make sure that we stay competitive and appreciate the service that you provide to the James City County um, customers. Chris and Barbara, thank you very much for coming. And it's amazing watching the ports over the last 10 years, how far the port has come and how far it's going with the dredging and everything else and the, the gantries and, and all the new stuff that you've put in there. And it, it's a key important component to our region. You know, so y'all are very important to this region and making sure that all of us, even all the way up in James City County, have the ability to, to work with the ports and all that in order to make this, this whole thing come true because it's, it's, it's economic development all the way. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for that. And, and we're in complete agreement. I mean, it is something where, you know, the maritime economy is in the fabric of this region. And it's something I think most of us very much embrace. And, and there's tremendous opportunity into the future. 
good job. Thank you. I'd thank like you to very just much. briefly say thank you for being here as well. I think it's important for our citizens to hear presentations like this so they can also understand um, further the significance and the important role this plays, especially for James City County. We kind of like it here. So thank you very much for being thank here you. and sharing um, all your information with us today. You're welcome. Appreciate thank it. so much. Off the great afternoon. All right, next on our presentation is James City County Clean County Commission 2022 Annual Report. Peg. Afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, members of the board, Mr. Stevens, Mr. Purse, Mr. Kinsman, and ladies and gentlemen, I'm Peg Borman, as you all know me as a trash lady, and I'm here to give you a presentation today. I hope you'll enjoy it better than my trash talk. But um, um, first, let me introduce you to some of the um, Clean County Commissioners. With me today is Jennifer Pye and Bruce Scouse. He's our, they're two of our newest uh, board members and uh, David uh, Patterson is um, there they are <laughs> um, David Patterson and Jennifer and Bruce are the um, newest members and um, also I have uh, Kevin Radcliffe with me also today and I don't want to forget uh, Cassie um, I thought you were going to work this thing for me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Remote. <laughs> uh, as you can tell, I'm not too good at those little gadgets. But anyway, um, Cassie Cordova has been, you might say, my right arm because she is the right arm of the of the commission. She ha she uh, has done a real good job of um, helping us get things together and and. With Regina Jackson's help, we have certainly done a, a magnificent job, I think, the last couple to three years. Um, okay, the next program that I want to talk about is um, the litter program. And it's, um, um, we, have, we have the litter league, and I mentioned this to you last, uh, last meeting when I was here, that we do have um, the checkouts at the library that you can go and take care of cleaning up yourself if you want to um, um, have the have the time and the energy that's always good um, <clears throat> and then we have the adopt a spots we um, we have the um, Anheuser-Busch is that um, um, they've given us uh, one cleanup in the past year, and we um, with two hours. We have the Boy Scout troop at uh, 414 that meets that cleans up the computer lot out at um, off of Croker Road. Colonial Veterinarian uh, they've put in 16 hours. The Colonial Vet Veterinarians have put in 60 hours, and they're out off of Route 5 and and. Uh, I think it's ironbound and the James City Ruitans uh, Club meets some um, they've cleaned up on there at the on Centerville next to um, free as part of Freedom Park the um, they put in 17 hours Stonehouse um, has three different um, sites within the, the housing complex there and um, they have one one section has done seven hours, another section has done two hours, and the other one has done nine hours. We also have <coughs> the War Hill High School has an environmental club, and they've put in 27 hours picking up out there around the high school. And then Jamestown High School also has a... Um, group that picks up, I think they're, it's a class that does that. 
they, pi they picked up uh, 38 hours. So we've got a total of 169 hours of picking up litter around the county from different groups. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the glass recycling. As you know, we, um, we got a DEQ grant, and you've seen those purple buckets. I think we brought them to, here to the commission, to the board meetings, and we've had them out there, and they were a hot subject there for a while. Um, but we, we're partnering with um, Owens, Illinois, and uh, we've, had, um, we've had several pop-up events, at a couple at the rec center. Um, we've been over to the ReStore with the cool car cruisers uh, by the ReStore pro um, property. At the James City Library, the fire department's open house, the uh, Fido Fest, Harvest Fest, Repair Fair and Expo, and we've, um, as of today, we had on here 198,880 uh, pounds, but as of today, we've got 205,412 pounds of glass that's been collected. So that's, I think that's a, an outstanding um, accomplishment for us at this point. It's something that we... Um, we talked about for several years of trying to get it started, and we finally, with the help of uh, Kate and Chris and at economic development and all that, they've, they've done a good, great job. And <clears throat> Cassie put together a, a, a newsletter, and I hope you all read it. It was called um, All Hands on Deck, and um, through her efforts and and the, in combination with the um, Clean County Commission, she's uh, done a great job of uh, giving us different lines of information and keeping us all abreast of, of what's going on within the county. And each of you, I hope, have been able to read it. We've, gone, we've went from January of last year with 283 delivered to 511 this year. So uh, now I know that some of you have been to the uh, Clean Business Awards, and the first picture up there is uh, from Homestead out on uh, in Stonehouse. That was in um, uh, the first quarter, and then... Um, Let's see, the second quarter was at Sweet Lavender. And then we had, um, uh, that was in Powhatan. We had Miss Sadler, and then we had Mr. Hippel. I think you both were, you both were the first one, I think, weren't you? Anyway. Um, and then we had Noah's Ark. And then we just recently had the dermatology of, um, Center of Williamsburg, which is off of, um, that's in Mr. Eisenhower's uh, area. So, but we really need somebody from Berkeley and from Roberts again. <laughs> Not that I'm putting y'all on the spot, but I've given you those little cards, so I hope you're utilizing them. Um, then in March of last year, we had the Great American Cleanup. And um, it was um, that we had five groups that five, we that's in conjunction with our um, Ask HR Green um, forum that we Cassie meets with once a once a month. Um, we had five groups that did that with forty eight with forty seven volunteer hours with four hundred and fifty six pounds of, of trash picked up. And then, which always gets to my, my heart because I've been doing this since it's for the very first one, and that's the 44th Annual County, Countywide Spring Litter Cleanup. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, 
a lot of people thought it was spring cleanup for my for their attics and their garages and all of that. But I decided last year that I didn't like that. So I kind of took a bull by the horns and said, we're not going to have this anymore. And if it's not from the roadside and the cleanup from the county, you're not going to bring any more back out here. And that was to the landfill. And I kind of felt like I was going to get crucified and run over to run off the property, but I managed to stay in there. So this year, I hope that we will succeed in having litter cleaned up and not free um, free dumping as, as far as these. But my grandma, what am I going to tell her? And I just yell, tell her she'll pay just like the rest of us do. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we had 20 groups that volunteered. We had 368 hours put in. We had 193 bags with a total of 8,070 8, pounds. And we only, this, is, this one really blew me away. We only collected 27 tires, which is really a great accomplishment in the fact that we've had as many as 500 in the past. So, and then we move on to April. And we had Earth and uh, Arbor Day combined out at Freedom Park. And we planted a tree out at the, um, and it included two sister trees from the uh, new Williamsburg Botanical Garden and Freedom Park Arboretorium. And we planted an American chestnut and um, and one in the garden, and then one in the Free Black Settlement. And we took a picture with um, um, little Rinzo, Cassie's little boy, because he was a year old that day. And um, we're going we're gonna to gauge that tree's growth by his growth. I don't know which will be best, but which will we, we come up first. But anyway, uh, <laughs> we also, um, <clears throat> we had the, Repair fair. The first one we had was in May of um, last year, and we had it was a real success because we've never done anything like this before. But we thought, why if you can't repair, if you can't use it or repurpose it, we can repair it, and then instead of throwing it in the landfill, and so we um, we had. 20 items that were uh, jewelry and small appliances, computers and furniture all that was done at that time. And then um, we had also in November, we had the um, second uh, repair fair and that was at the expo. I think we might have another slide on that. And we can't forget the Will Barnes Day picnic. Uh, a lot of you remember Will Barnes. Um, he passed away in June of 2016. And the Ruitans, he was a big member in the Ruitans, they created this garden uh, um, plot there that we take care of every year. And then we have a picnic each year, and that's some great pictures there from that. We enjoyed every minute of it, and I hope the rest of you that was there did too. And so um, we have the Good Neighbor Grant. Um, that is, we had four, four um, neighborhoods that took care of um Putting in for grants for that, and they'll be giving, getting their um, final checks in the, um, April, I think it is, this year. And that's the, we try to do this every year as best we can. Um, and then we have the pollinator gardens. We had, um, we just gave a, a bench to that um, 
area that we've collected the um, plastic bags, 500 pounds of plastic bags in conjunction with the Lions Club. And uh, that creates a bench, about 30 or 60,000 bags. <laughs> anyway, um, this was started a year ago. And it's, as you can see, it's really taken off and looks makes the park look very nice. Um, we also have, the, there's the benches. The one is over at, um, put out for WADA at, in front of Publix. And this one was at the, um, at the uh, pollinator gardens. And I think that was one of the coldest days we've had, <laughs> as you can tell. So, um, then we had, we, we've gotten this material sorting game. And if anybody wants to, you can go on this and on the website and you can play it. And it's, it's a fun game. <laughs> you get a picture wherever it goes. think the kids will enjoy this more than maybe adults will too. <laughs> anyway, then we're moving on to our cigarette litter uh, prevention. We've had this uh, display at several places throughout the county. Perhaps you've seen them. And I know that from the beginning, I thought cigarette butts was the worst litter problem we had, but it, it's not gone away, and I don't guess it's going to go away. We keep trying to impress upon people that, that they need to work on uh, keeping them in an ashtray inside the vehicle and not littering the ground. And, and let's see, there, there's the expo from... From this past November, we had the restore was there. We had the glass recycling. We did uh, gone for good with shredding. We had the Lions Club collecting um, the bags. Um, we had the uh, tire recycling and um, soles for soles. That was shoes and clothing and so forth. Um, it was a fun day, and I hope that. If you came out, you enjoyed it. If you didn't, come out next year. And uh, this was a re, um, where they were recycling. We had bicycles. We had sewing machines. We had small par uh, things and uh, a jewelry uh, there and a sewing person. And then we have the litter index. Now, this was done last year in January, and we do the five... Um, watersheds and it's the um, uh, all over the county um, it's it's really an eye-opener if you've never went on something like this before but it's it's always interesting but I have to say from the first one I went on until I hope this time there's been a great improvement in all the illegal dumping so and this, tell, this tells us just about where we stand as far as uh, litter throughout the county. And uh, we'll be doing uh, this litter index again. Um, and this is through Keep America Beautiful. Uh, we'll be doing this again on Friday this week, the 27th. Um, and then we have the results of our labors. As you can see, we've had... Um, a number of presentations, not too many in, in 2020 and 21. Um, there was scarce, but we did some. And then in 22, we've had quite a number of presentations, workshops, displays. Um, one thing that we're lacking right now is youth presentation, but we do have um, a joint effort on that and trying to get more youth involved. Uh, we once had the schools involved, but um, in the last few years, we haven't been able to, to really work with the schools as much as we'd like to. 
So as you can see, we've, um, we've come a long way. Uh, we want to thank all of our volunteers. We not just our commissioners, but um, we've had volunteers that from throughout the county and up and down the county, and some are not even listed here, but um, they are all very valuable to us. And even though your name's not up there, know that we appreciate you. So, any questions? Question for Peg. Just a big thank you to all of you for all your efforts. Much appreciated. Yes, if I could ask your group to stand up so we can applaud them for all their hard effort. It is a it is a thankless job at times, and <laughs> and I know we're riding through the county and see a section of road that's clean, and then you go by the next day and there's trash back out there. I know. And it's a shame. I wish the the people that are either throwing it out or blowing out on vehicles or whatever would would start maintaining a better presentation in the county because it affects all of us. That's right. I agree with you, and I wish that I knew an answer to that, but I've been mulling out of it for 40 some years and I haven't come up with a good answer yet but um, uh, there's one thing I would like to do is people could sign up this year to pick up the trash and we are going to do it a little differently this year so I think if you sign up you might be happy to find that you don't have to work quite as hard as you have in the past and um, we hope to um, have a larger number this year than we've had in the past. Uh, of course, at one time, we used to have five or 600 people out there, but um, even more than that. But that was back then. Now we're, people don't volunteer as much, but let's hope that they will get motivated. And if I keep talking trash long enough, maybe they'll hear me. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, next presentation is the James City County Audit presentation. Ms. Roberts. Ms. is going to give a few introductory okay. comments first. Chairman, members of the board, um, good afternoon. I'm Cheryl Holland. I'm the Assistant Director of Financial and Management Services for the county. With me today is Leslie Roberts, an audit partner at Brown Edwards. Leslie will go through the county's FY22 financial statement audit, uh, but before she does, I'll provide a few brief remarks. As you know, we typically present the audit in December, um, but we did encounter a few delays this year. Um, those delays included a uh, loss of key staff at several of our, um, our fiscal agents in, in terms of their um, finance staff, and those fiscal agencies' audits have to be completed before we can begin the county's audit. Also, we experienced turnover within FMS, um, which meant we had fewer people working on the audit, um, and we also had to spend some of our time recruiting and training new staff. In addition, we had a major financial software upgrade this past fall, which required significant time from our staff to test and, and plan the upgrade to the system. Lastly, we also went through the implementation of a substantial GASB accounting standard on leases, and Leslie will go into that in more detail um, in her presentation. Um, despite these challenges, FMS staff and the team at Brown Edwards did work diligently to complete the financial statements and the related audit. Um, I would like to thank my staff as well as Leslie's team for all of their hard work on this. And with that, um, unless there are any questions for me, I'll turn the presentation over to Leslie to go through the results of the audit. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Welcome yeah. back. Yeah, yep. Good afternoon instead of evening. I've never heard <laughs> during the afternoon before. Um, like she said, it, this has been a challenging year as far as staffing and staffing turnover. That's not just the county's issue. That's kind of a industry-wide, um, um, country-wide issue. We've experienced the same thing. Um, with less finance, less people are majoring in accounting the these days. So there's less to choose from, and it's just, it's a difficult staffing environment. As far as the new lease um, implementation, James City County is not the only one that struggled with that. I don't have a governmental I don't have a governmental client that didn't struggle with that. And part of it is because the GASB had that implemented before the FASB which is unusual. Usually you see the FASB or the for-profit arena implementing something. 
And so the GASB gets to follow it, and usually there's a lot more out there to follow, you know, a lot more guidance. So anyway, I can, I can tell you this isn't specific to James City County, these delays, these issues with staffing, all, and, and the implementation, it's been challenging. Um, just to start going through it, um, on page one through three is our audit opinion, and that is another clean, unmodified opinion. We do mention in there about the change in accounting principle, that is the new implementation that we talked about. And for James City County, that was pretty, it, it was on both sides, both the leaseor and the leasee side. You had to get that on your statement and that position. So um, it was coming and going for you. Um, moving on, pages four through nine, I always tell you guys to take a look at that because that's kind of a high level picture. It gives some explanation for changes year over year and so forth. Um, the basic financials start on page 10 and go through page seven. So that's hard to believe when you look at that big document that the basic financials are just those pages. But um, page 10 is your statement of net position. And um, just the bottom line, your net position is strong, 388 million in total. And of that total, about 146 million is unrestricted, which means you can use it for the needs of the county. And so that's good to see, that's a strong net position. Also, there's a letter of transmittal that comes after the management's, that comes before management's discussion and analysis that I forgot to mention. That also gives some more information, high level information about the county. That's a good read. Um, moving on, the statement of activities, which um, is right after um, on page 11. And basically the bottom line there is you had a strong change in net position. It was positive to the tune of 37 million. And part of that is because of the increase in tax revenues and so forth. And a lot of it relates to COVID, people getting out, doing things, spending money, so you're collecting taxes. And another part of it, your um, pension liability went down by quite a bit this year. So that's part of that increase in net position. The notes to the financial statements I won't go into, but they're on pages 18 through 78. And basically they give more information on some of the line items in your financials and more information about the county's accounting uh, policies and procedures and just a deeper dive. Moving on, there's another statement that we, that we required to present as part of your um, financial reporting. And that's a statement on internal control over financial rep reporting itself. And so if we had any issues with financial reporting, not, we, we know we've, we're delayed, but we didn't have any issues. We didn't have any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies. So the delay was just that, a delay. There weren't any issues that we did not have any control issues to report. And then there's yet another report that, well, there's a listing of state code compliance issues that we go into. The Auditor of Public Accounts requires us to look at st some compliance issues or some compliance areas of the state code. Um, we look at cash and investment laws, we look at conflict of interest forms and whether they're filed on time, procurement laws, stuff like that. So it's kind of like a compliance audit within an audit. And we did not, our test that we performed didn't reveal any non-compliance on any of this. Um, the next report is on internal control over major federal programs. This is where you're getting in federal money and spending it. There's all kinds of rules around what you can do, what, how you can spend that and how you need to account for that money. We go in and we choose major programs every year and audit those programs, some of them are on a, re, a, a rotational basis, like Head Start and some of the bigger prop, you know, like um, the food services for the schools. Those are always big programs that we rotate. But um, this year we actually did four program audits and normally we do two, some years three, but a lot of it's because of the money, the, the CARES money that came in. And that was a program all in, in and of itself that we audited. So. Um, with this year's audit, we did a lot more work just because of the auditing four programs. And again, that's like the APA stuff, it's compliance stuff. Did you do everything you needed to, from reporting to checking eligibility and that type of thing. 
Um, and we did not have any findings and we didn't have any control issues. So everything went well with that part of the audit. Um, moving on, there's another document. It's usually stapled that you guys get, but I know you're probably getting everything electronically now, but it says report to those in charge of governance and that's you. And a lot of it is really boilerplate. It's stuff that we're required to say. And so I just point out a couple things. Um, there is a con contact information page that has my contact information, Danielle Nicolaisen's, your engagement director's contact information, and Katie Babb, your manager's contact information. We're all available to talk and, and answer questions subsequent to this or throughout the year. Um, also, in that letter, under significant audit matters, we talk about, yet again, the lease implementation. <laughs> so if you didn't, if you missed it in the financials, here it is again, because it was a big deal. Um, significant disclosures, we feel like your disclosures around capital assets and long-term debt and commitments and contingencies are very significant um, to the user of your financials. As far as estimates, any financial statements has a lot of estimates in it. So we point out the big ones for you. Your pension liability. Remember I said that went way down? A lot of that is because the earnings, and we're a year in arrears. Next year it might flip around that way. But um, that's a, there are a lot of estimates from life expectancy, how long you're going to be a recipient of the, uh, the pension plan, the current employees, is gobs of estimates, discount rate, everything. Um, same thing with OPEP. Um, there's lots of estimates in that. Um, some other big estimates around the lease implementation. You est we're estimating whether you're going to renew or not. We're estimating a discount rate so we can discount out those cash flows. So there's some estimates in that too. Um, I think I got all the significant estimates. Uh, let's see if I missed any. OPEP pension. Oh, the useful life of your equipment because capital assets are so important to you. We assign a useful life, but that is an estimate. We don't know how long that equipment's gonna last. So that's another big one. Um, we did not have any significant difficulties completing our audit, even though we're delayed. We, nothing was difficult. We worked in collaboration with your, with your staff. Um, all, all audit adjustments were posted are in there, but they all related to this lease implementation. So um, we, worked in conjunction with their staff on that. There were no uncorrected misstatements that we didn't post, so there's nothing of that in there. And um, we did not have any disagreements with management. And I tell you every year, if we had any problems with the audit or disagreements with management, I'd be talking to you guys earlier, be it by email or as a presentation, but we didn't have any of that. Um, the rest of it is pretty much boilerplate and language that's included. There is a section that's got new GASBs that are coming up, so if you're really interested in what's coming up, you can look at that. Um, the least one was a biggie, and there's several that are coming up. The GASB's busy writing them now, so. <laughs> but there's, it's, it's, it's a lengthy write-up. Um, but you've gone through a couple of pretty impactful GASBs over the last several years. Leases, I mean, leases is one of them, but OPEB, pension, all that stuff. So there's some coming down the pike. None that come to the, that I think will be as impactful as some of those, like pension and OPEB, pension especially. And some people argue that OPEB is not a real liability. So, you know, that was a big, that was a controversial one. But uh, anyway, that's all written up. Um, I want to thank the staff for sticking with this. This was a, this was a challenging year for both parties, and we worked and collaborated and came out with good opinions on all, on all fronts. So, any questions? No questions, Ms. Roberts. Mm -hmm. If I could just ask, ask one question, that is, uh, you know, every time you, you come, we, uh, uh, we very much appreciate the, the great work that you, you do for us and uh, the collaborative spirit uh, between our staff and, and uh, your staff. Uh, but we hear about uh, GASB and the changes that are, are coming. What drives the decision to make change in GASB? <laughs> I wish I knew. I mean, <laughs> I mean, they start talking. A lot of the GASBs come from the FASBs. You know, they, they say, okay, they implemented that. That makes sense in our arena. Um, leases is a conundrum, you know, because, uh, you know, they say that, the, the idea is it's more transparent because it's right on your statement of net position. 
But then again, we used to have footnotes that gave all that information. And like I said, there's a lot of estimates involved. Like if you decide not to renew a lease that renews 10 years at a time, that makes a big difference. That number would be completely different if that was the case. And like this year, we're using discount rates that are slightly higher than what I would have used last year this time. So does that, so that grosses up the asset and the liability. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, the idea behind all of these GASBs and FASBs is to make it easier for the user of the financials. Some of them are more impactful and more, I guess you could argue, are more useful to the financial, to the users. But that's the bottom line. And, you know, GASB is an entity. You know, they talk about these things and they get input from the public and they get input from accountants like me. But um, how they come up with some of these things, I, you know. What does it do to comparability year to year? Well, I mean, you know, we try to, some of these you have to go back and restate the prior year. And so, and when you look at your, um, the MDNA that I point out that has the comparative information, if we are presenting a comparative year, we'll, we'll update that year. But like, you, when you look at your financials, they're not comparative. Because if they were, they would be like this thick. Because there's so much in there, it's, and mostly the notes and the other required stuff. But um, the, we do restate it in the MDNA. But yeah, I mean, most of these, it's effective the first day of the year of the implementation. So leases was effective 7-1-21 and you roll it through. So it does impact comparability if you were to look at it over the long term. Thank you very much for that mm -hmm. explanation and, and for the uh, very thorough report and uh, the good uh, report on your working relationship with our staff. Any other questions? I want to thank you as well. And um, it's good to hear we have a clean report, understanding that everybody's been late with, with trying to compete with Everything is going on, and it's great to hear. And the citizens all know what a great staff we have in financial management and what a great team we have in James City County that are making sure that everything is, especially with COVID and, and all the money that was coming in, and federal says you can do this, state says you can do this. Can't, you know, there's, there's a lot of things you can and can't do, and, and we questioned it a few times on, can we use that for this? And we were told, no, you've got to keep this within this. So it was, staff did a very good job, and, and I want to thank staff and, and everything you did as well, letting us know ahead of time that, hey, we're going to be behind a little bit, but it's be, these are the reasons. So this board was, you know, knew that we'd be behind a little bit on getting the report out and getting everything out. So, you know, it, it's just a good teamwork from everybody around. So appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Next, we're looking at number five, Powhatan Creek Watershed and Pervious Cover Update. Tony, welcome. <laughs> Finally got up here. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Mr. Stevens. Um, Tony Small, Stormwater and Resource Protection uh, Division Director. So as you know, the division's been working with a consultant to prepare updates to the Powhatan and Yarmouth uh, watershed management plans, and we're starting with the update to Powhatan Creek. Uh, one of the initial tasks was to prepare an impervious cover calculations for the watershed that were originally prepared in 2001 with an update in 2008. So we have our consultant uh, for this project, Stan Tech, here to present the results of the impervious cover update today, and we're happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, so if you have no other questions right now, with further, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Peter Chata and Travis Krajowski to do the presentation. Questions? And I'm so glad you, I, 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 I just like, I know, I recognize, and it was Travis, and I, thank goodness I wasn't losing my mind, so. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Great, wonderful, thank you. Hi, everyone, thank you very much, Tony. Helped with this uh, this report. Good afternoon, everybody. I will do my best to uh, keep this uh, sensible and, and go through it. And, and I look forward to answering any questions you might have. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so we really did work a lot with the planning staff and others to to really get an idea of what's what's gone on, and what we think may go on moving forward. Okay. So first, I'm just going to talk about 
the impervious cover model, what it is, what it means. Uh, and then we'll go through sort of previous work, uh, bring up to date, talk about what we did basically the last couple of months with this, um, and then focus in on the, on the area of high interest that we were called to make sure we looked at uh, specifically. And we'll go into questions. Excuse me. <clears throat> so the impervious cover model, uh, is it's been around for a while, um, decades. Uh, and it's gone through uh, some, some changes over time. It used to look like this graph, and of course, and things aren't so black and white uh, in the world or, or distinct. So you get you know, these zones, uh, 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 transition zones, they call them here, uh, where really what happens is as, you, as the impervious cover within your watershed increases, uh, you see a tendency that the downstream waterways uh, become disturbed in one or more ways, right? And so this is just a general relationship that you see. So, you know, we, it's a lot easier for us to think about the impervious cover we've got in the watershed than to go walk every stream uh, many times a year and see what's going on there. Although there's some like Travis and I who do like to do that, but <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll move on from that. Uh, there are some limitations to this model and any model. Uh, this one uh, doesn't deal with um, how connected the impervious surface is to your waterways. Sometimes uh, curb and gutter will transport the water faster than somewhere like grass swales and older neighborhoods. So that's one thing. Stormwater treatment practices, often called BMPs, whether they're basins or grass swales or more uh, in intricate things, wetlands, um, they're not accounted for in terms of their value and impact uh, in addressing water delivered from impervious surfaces. And it doesn't, you know, account for all sources of pollution as well. But it's pretty good in terms of telling you what's going on in larger areas like this. So prior conditions, uh, uh, like Tony mentioned, you know, there's some work done in uh, 2000, 2001 uh, that, that gave us some results here. Uh, and there's three categories. That's a, a threshold of the impervious surface cover model, where 10 percent, you know, there are a lot of scientists have gone through and <coughs> drawing a line and saying that 10% is sort of this threshold you cross where things really start to de degrade and, and, and get impacted. So if you're below 10%, like in 2000 and, and 2008, you get this green color within the watershed. It's a, it is a, it is a water, sub-watershed sort of scale analysis. So you can break it up more, uh, you know, and say, well, what's your average impervious for a neighborhood? But this is the best sort of way to report and then get to finer details. So both um, 2000 and 2008 here. Uh, so you're seeing that you've got, you know, six impacted in 2000, increases to eight, uh, adding in 208 and 209, uh, you know, the Newtown area and downstream of that uh, <coughs> off a of news road. Uh, but at, at that time, there was still nothing that had gotten that impervious average above or approaching 25% yet. We go to what we, we did uh, with a lot of support from Ellen and planning and, and others within the county staff to help us think about, okay, well, what is your existing previous? Uh, get that data from your GIS folks, uh, some of the better data I've, I've worked with as I've done watershed planning for, for a couple of decades now, so it makes it a lot easier for me to do my job. Uh, and this is where you're at. You, you've now seen that with this model, where you have that threshold of 10% previous, uh, all of the subwatersheds within the Powhatan Creek watershed have reached that threshold and are, are considered uh, impacted, with two of them uh, getting up to the 25% impervious, so one-fourth of the watershed impervious, right? Um, and they call that non-supporting. <coughs> Excuse me. Then we look at moving forward, and this is where uh, we did a lot of review of plans that had been submitted, the comprehensive plan, uh, the parcel data set, looking at, um, you know, infill and existing developments, uh, potential planning of, uh, of things moving forward. Uh, and so what we call this is like the future or full build out, right? So we're, if you were to build everything that you think you're going to build, this is it. Whether you want to call that 2050 or what have you, uh, you know, that's a, that's, a, that's a fortune teller to tell, right? But um, at, at this point, when we think, you go that route, you see two additional subwatersheds go to that pink red color. They're non supporting, crossing that threshold of 25%. Okay? And again, I talked about the area of high interest, the sort of two, parts of 207 uh, 
eight and nine. We'll look at that in just a little bit. Um, and some scenario implications as well. For those that don't do maps and like tables or they prefer graphs, I like to give it all. Um, and I've color coded this uh, table to help. Uh, I'm a very visual person. So again, we talked about, say, in the future, full build out, you see four, it's 207, 8, 9, 10. And these gives you the exact numbers. Uh, you know, again, the threshold being 10, 15, and, and 20. Um, the, doesn't show as well on the screen I'm looking at. We tried to make it a little bit better for, for the, the, with the report in terms of these transition zones. Help you tell a story of, uh, you know, maybe you're not at 10%, but you're 9.6%, so you're pretty close, right? Something like, um, <clears throat> what, what did I just see? When like 204 was already approaching 10% back in 2000. These numbers, again, are in the report, but uh, obviously a trend, and you see some that are uh, where you look ahead, like 208, 207, you see those orange bars much higher than, than the existing. So how did we do that? Uh, I mentioned already, we looked at plans. We looked at zoning, comprehensive plans, um, all sorts of ways to think about where the development might happen. And this figure basically shows it in a nutshell, right? So all of your existing impervious is red within this, this image, and the, the yellow showing up is where we projected impervious to happen. Now, in this case, I think many people notice the Eastern State Hospital being uh, redeveloped, that property there. Um, but what we did is we, we really tried to manage the pattern of development, and this is what I call a spatially explicit, explicit approach where um, instead of assuming a parcel of one acre would have this much impervious and a parcel of five acres would have so much impervious, I really wanted to match the patterns of development that you expect at our neighboring also. So really try to be a little bit smarter about that. And it sets you up for potential future analyses of, okay, well, what is the connectedness district? So now, now that it is a spatial, you can think about, okay, well, which ones are going to which streams and how close is it and what kind of stormwater infrastructure is there to help uh, inform future analyses and, and address challenges. Lots of little yellow dots in there on, on, on existing developments just to account for all of it. Okay, so one thing that was done in 2008 uh, by these teams, Mr. Colson over there. Uh, hard to think that it was 14, 15 years ago now, but um, we did a projection as well, right? I just talked about that with that map, and we thought, well, let's just compare. And of course, GIS, the mapping, uh, the technology, the software, the information uh, from developers aren't on paper. It's actually digital now. All these things allow us to do more uh, in 2022. But just it was interesting to compare these numbers and see in some cases the projections for uh, full build out, right, done in 2008 and done just now by us. You know, in some cases, very relatively close. That's pretty good. Good job, Mike. Um, <laughs> for 15 years, 13 years ago. Uh, so, so that's just something to, to note. Now, I talked about the area of high interest. This is basically subwater says 208 and 9, a little bit of non tidal and uh, southeast side of 207. Uh, Subwatershed 207 there. <clears throat> um, obviously, there is, um, you know, there's there's the Newtown property and fully building it out and thinking about that. There's the potential Eastern State Hospital property. Uh, is it, you know, being sold, developed? What are the plans, et cetera, zoning? Um, and then it, and then also, you know, bringing into account the potential 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 additional development over by the the recreation center there. So let's just take a look at what we've got here, and this is where we did some scenarios with and without uh, Eastern State Hospital, which will be of interest. This is showing with the redevelopment, zooming in, giving us a better notion of that, uh, and looking at um, you know what does that do as, as you go from, say, today to a full build out on that graph there, and, and how much um, impervious area you're increasing there. Now, I do want to call the note that the two bookended uh, on, on that box plot there, uh, those are partial areas. So uh, it, it looks like non-tidal has nothing and then is going to be very developed. That's just that partial area. And, and I did some, uh, some context for you all in the report as well as here, just to, so you don't freak out and think, well, what is going on in non-tidal versus two, 
oh seven, eight, and nine. Um, and so you know, again, we go from from some being in the impacted zone for a couple of these, and everything heads up to except for the non-tidal to the, the non-supporting zone. I could have sworn I put that slide in there. I am so sorry. So we can talk about the Eastern State Hospital development and, and, and its implications. I could have sworn we had a slide in there. Did we take that out? I, no. Oh, it's after. I wanted to be cognizant of time, so I didn't put it in the main body. <laughs> but if you would like, we can move on to that. But I do want to give opportunity for general questions before we maybe go down a rabbit hole on that. Then, did anybody have some general questions? <clears throat> okay. Oh, no. <laughs> <Here> <laughs> <it> slides. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this is that sub-watershed scale context I was telling you about, right? If you consider the change in impervious into the future for the entire uh, area of, 207, uh, of 207, this is this is the partial area of it, right, where you see a very large increase, 22.4 to 38.3 percent. But if you put in the context of the full sub-watershed, you know, we really, the area of high interest focused on the undeveloped or potentially redeveloped area of 207, so it made it look like it was increasing impervious quite a bit more. And the same thing with the non-title here. I threw this graph together to show, okay, yes, you are improving, but it's not as dire as you say, as you see there, if you just take in the, into account the partial area. Okay. Very good. Okay, in this graph here on the top, what I wanted to talk through is with and without Eastern uh, State uh, Hospital property being redeveloped. Okay, so uh, I, I apologize that this yellow is not coming out very well here, uh, but you can see it goes from 19.2 to 22.4 without redeveloping that partial, for that partial area. Okay, if you consider that in the context of the full watershed, you know, the full watershed has a higher impervious and goes up to 25.8, so that in theory, by the model standard, you go over a threshold, but by 0.8%. Um, and then 208 as well, modest increase if you don't do Eastern State Hospital. But then if you do have that property redeveloped in a, in a pattern that's similar to Newtown, where it's a mix of commercial, high-density residential, you know, just more impervious surface than you would say expect in a one-acre you know, dwelling unit per acre sort of suburban neighborhood. This is what you would expect to get. And of course, again, the 207 partial area, a big jump for that small area, but in the context of the watershed, you are increasing still significantly 5% impervious, right? And you're going from that transition zone in the impacted to, to, to the non-supporting. And again, a lot of that has to do with how connected do you allow the impervious and designs impervious surface to be to waterways and what types and what level of treatment you might do. So there are limitations, but it's a nice way to kind of look forward, if you will, and especially at those scenarios there. And this is a nice graph to kind of kind of complete, give you the complete picture again. Questions? Sorry, hopefully. Questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, let me uh, let me start with with one question that has sort of bothered me. As, as I was the one who had sort of requested that we get this update because <clears throat> when looking at um, rezoning applications that come before us, you can look at the impervious cover generated by that particular piece of property. Uh, and what we have always had a difficult time doing is connecting these watershed plans to specific rezoning. Uh, parcels. Um, and I'll give you an example. Um, if you take a look at what we've done originally back in 2000 or 2001, and they had the, where it was and what they were projecting, and then you go eight years forward and you look at where we were, and where we were exceeded the projections for build out, and we weren't anywhere near close to build out. And of course, then the projections got larger, and now what we're finding is the same thing is that if you come forward to this time point, now that's quite a few more years, that where we are today significantly exceeds what the projections were. Today. All right. So what it tells me is that 
one of two things. Either the projections are, there's something flawed in, with, with how we are doing projections. Or there's some other aspect that's at work here, which I think is the disconnect between what is really a good watershed plan and how we apply it. So, um, you know, when we when we look at, at what we've what we've been been doing is is um, from your perspective as someone who works with these things, what do you what what do you feel intuitively that that we are are, are dealing with? Is it is it is it a, a, a a fallacy or a failure or, or uh, something in, in, in the design of how we are doing this or is it uh, merely the fact that you're updating and reflecting reality that you can't accommodate or plan for because it's not something that uh, you have a ability to project. It's what we do in the intervening years when we approve all of these different uh, uh, approvals for uh, land use. Sure. As a it's, it's a little, it, it's just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of asking your opinion on it because it just sort of, it's sort of, it's bothered me is that we spend a lot of money on really good watershed plans. And then the question is, do we really use them? Do we really use them? Do we use them in making decisions about the future of the county? Um, <clears throat> and I'm not convinced that we do. I'm not convinced that it's necessarily a failure of the, of the, of the plan, or the, of, of your plan or your process. It's just that when the plan meets reality, something gives. You're not the only community that has that struggle and asks the same questions, right? Like it's, it's a push and pull that is, is constant with any, any community, especially those uh, that are challenged by not being within the purview of the entire watershed as well and having upstream neighbors that have del deleterious impacts. But um, yeah, no, it's a, it is a very big challenge because watershed management plans can and often do make recommendations both for regulatory levers to help meet objectives and goals that are listed out in the watershed management plan. Some of them can be very specific and give you better site design and recommendations, right, for actual design of the properties and then design of stormwater management and, and to do that, right? But again, those are all just recommendations where mm. with development and developers, they're bound by regulations for stormwater and all other, all other codes and regulations that they do as they go from taking trees down to putting in smoke detectors and carbon monoxide. Like there's all these rules, but they're meeting those regulations, right? Obviously, you have inspectors and such that, that go there. Um, so how do you um, translate your high-reaching goals of the watershed management plan to the reality of what happens? And of course, as you said, in the intervening years, you have ups and downs economically and interest and back and forth, right? I don't have a good answer for you or a silver bullet right now. However, I, I have done a lot of, a lot of uh, watershed scale analyses, and one of the things that I try to avoid the most is producing a document, just a document, that is going to go on your bookshelf if it gets even printed out anymore and doesn't get, isn't used. So actionable plans, uh, sometimes you get some conceptual designs on, well, this is might be something you can picture and see. It's not a full design of a community and, a, and say, the stormwater to address it, but to encourage you and encourage you to consider ways to then encourage your community to be involved, the development uh, process to, to 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 do better okay. and to meet those needs. Um, let me let me ask, uh, I, I, and I think one of the problems here is this. I'll use a term that's been used here before. It's called cumulative impact. Um, you know, we 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 measure incremental impact, but we we don't take a look sometimes at what the cumulative impact is until it's too late. Um, uh, clearly, Eastern State is going to be um, the big issue uh, for us going forward. And that's going to be coming up fairly soon. And so um, any information we can get on um, the watershed, the watershed management plans that we can use to help us in making any decisions that we go forward, I think it would be really helpful. But uh, there are a couple of things that uh, I'd, I'd like to ask you to consider um, and maybe give me your, your, your thought process on, on how you do it. 
Um, from talking to some of my uh, folks uh, on the Planning Commission, um, they, they talk about how we have uh, monitoring stations in a couple of places uh, on the eastern state R RPAs that measure uh, benthic invertebrates, which is a, like he, he, I think it was mentioned, that's the canary in the coal mine, which tells you uh, a lot about the health of the stream. And these are mostly downstream from where the development itself would be occurring. So uh, I guess the question is, what is the, um, um, you know, those, those stations were there before mm -hmm. as a result of a new town proffer, I gather. Um, how do you, are you planning on using that data or, 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 or is it would be helpful for us to try to help talk to a developer about uh, additional monitoring stations because ultimately what goes there is going to have an impact downstream. And we do the best we can with uh, all these different best management practices and runoff things, but ultimately it gets to the end of the stream and goes downstream. And we wind up spending a tremendous amount of money doing stream restoration and trying to fix these problems downstream that are caused by the cumulative impact of development upstream. Um, and I think the figure for James City County since 2017 is a little over $7 million that we put into that. So, and some of these things that we build have 20, 30 year lifespans. So, you know, you're gonna be, there's, there's a, it's an ongoing constant amount of money that we're gonna have to be putting into these kinds of things. We really need to make better decisions on how we're going to do that. So, how, 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 what ability do you have to take a look at um, how you think uh, that would be uh, affect the downstream water quality, and then how you can actually monitor and, and, and tell us what, did it in fact perform the way you thought it would? Yeah, no, that's a a great question, and I think we're in a good position to do that. Both one because we're in the watershed ourselves, our office, and many of us live there, but also. Uh, we know stream restoration, we know the cost, we know BMPs, we know what that means and the level of effort and as you're identifying, right, the ounce of prevention is yep. the pound of, and, you know, Travis and I were just talking when we had the time before this meeting started about those monitoring stations. Okay. So as much data as I can get, I will use for sure. And and I, I you can ask Alan, I definitely don't leave stones unturned when I'm looking to get data, I try to get as much, you know, like, as much as I can, having them scrape down weird places that data may have ended up to make sure that I have everything in my hands to, to inform a decision and to inform you all on this is what I've got for you, uh, you know, inform your decisions and your actions moving forward. So, uh, specific to the monitoring, yes. Uh, as much as there is available, absolutely. Uh, We'll make sure. I will add that to this, and I already mentioned this, uh, is that the impervious cover model is the, is sort of the quickest way to kind of, you know, it's, it's harder to go measure macroinvertebrate bug, bugs, right? Uh, so this is the quickest way to get at that without going and measuring bugs and having someone be able to tell you what kind of bug it is, which I've had to do one summer as an intern. I'm glad I don't do it. Um, the next step that we've been doing, and we're actually just about to submit this memo in somewhat of a similar fashion to this, is, is the water quality treatment, or the water treatment model, which talks about loading of land uses, okay, the different types, and how you're shifting from, say, forest and grass to, say, suburban development or impervious, and what that looks like for some of the major pollutants, that being bacteria, total nitrogen, total phosphorus, and total suspended sediment, right? Uh, all things that are of importance to Chesapeake Bay, but then also to you all in your streams and your local, local waterways. Uh, and so I think that will be also informative to talk about when we look at that and how we can think through a watershed like um, that that has Newtown and that that has Eastern State Hospital to, to do that, to, to sort of drill down in there and say, well, again, it's a model. Right, it's not being on the stream every day, looking at what happens after every storm and measuring the bugs and all the chemistry. But um, I think it will also be informative, and we're just wrap wrap that up and about to submit it in for for their review as well. So that's another line of evidence. This has to do with sort of the runoff response of a watershed: more impervious, faster runoff, more runoff, ruins your streams. The other piece is well, 
types of land use produce this kinds of pollutants now and into the future. So I think that's going to be another line of evidence. And we're going to be folding all this into that watershed management plan. Uh, yeah. Our challenge is to figure out a better way to use that in making day-to-day -day decisions. Yes. That is one of the biggest challenges that I have seen for uh, resource and land managers since I got into this career a couple of decades ago is, is putting the science and, and findings and facts and such into policy, effective policy. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So, so I think Mr. Eisner has really put his, his finger on, on a big concern uh, that I have and, and uh, an important issue for us to consider. Um, this afternoon, I'll be playing Ebenezer Scrooge. You'll be the ghost of Christmas present or Christmas future, if sure, you yeah. will. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, if, uh, and, and I'll ask you, you know, well, does it have to be this way? Um, uh, or can, can we do something to make, um, the future, uh, better, uh, for us? Um, I, I, I appreciate very much the idea that, you know, any kind of recommendations we can get about more effective means of treating the impact of the impervious cover within the watershed, uh, would be, would be very important for us to take into account when we think about adding to the uh, impervious cover uh, in a highly impacted area. But I also wonder about um, uh, whether does the do, how does the model incorporate the impact of impervious cover outside of the watershed that that comes into the watershed. Good question. Uh, this model, the impervious cover model, uh, did not include those small portions that come from York and Williamsburg. They're pretty small. The water quality model that we just did, we did include that because it's going to produce n pollutants of concern that come into your waterways and such. Um, I will say for the Powhatan, it's a very small area, small contribution of, of those pollutants. Um, with this, you don't have control over that development. Yes, it does have an impact um, on the, uh, the hydrodynamics of your waterways. I would say, again, because the area is relatively small, um, and in some cases they have ponds and, and management practices as well, um, with this watershed, I don't think that's a, a, a big contributor to, to your challenges. The, the challenges are how do you do the best way, how can you best develop land with the least downstream impact? That's and would that be generally true of these watersheds, or are, are we going to find different situations in the different watersheds? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, Yarmouth is pretty, I've already started looking forward uh, with that one. Pretty, I think it's all within JCC, as is Diaskin, which is down, we kind of have this rolling schedule, right? Um, this is all I'll be doing this year, um, just in different watersheds. Uh, you do have others that are more, uh, you know, where you might have a m very small piece and that goes off to York County. It, it, it happens, but none, not with Powhatan, Yarmouth, or Diaskin that we're looking at right now. Mill Creek, I think, um, remember the percentages. I don't remember off the top of my head, I'm sorry. Thank you. I, I appreciate the general uh, ex expression, though. Yeah. And a, a few. <coughs> um, and I think the board would agree that I don't want to go somewhere else to see clean water. <laughs> no one does. <laughs> no. And you go a Good community point. or two over, and you'll know exactly what I mean. Not picking on any other communities, but it is what it is where it is. Um, I think at times we look at, okay, what do we need to build? What do we need to get? How much we need to put in? How much... And, and we're almost looking at it backwards. What do we have? What is our resource now? And then what can we work into that resource? It's always been, this is what we're going to put, and the resource will deal with it. Well, that's what's happened to all the communities around here. And I really don't want to see it happen to James City County. And, uh, you know, and we need the tools in order to say, okay, if you put, not that you can't ever do anything, but if you do these things, you have to put this in place to protect what we have. 
which is the only thing. It's like I tell everybody, I say, the only thing I have to give is my time. The only thing the environment has to give is the environment. You know, and once you change it, I've never seen a subdivision put in that decided, a board decided, let's go ahead and tear it down and put it back in woods. So once we get to that point, it's, it's too far gone. So if we were to put in certain mechanisms to slow this impervious cover flow back out to our streams and everything else, you know, is that possible? Um, and then when it gets to non-supporting, exact when I hear non-supporting, I basically see either a, a ditch or and and I've gone to some of the other areas in the in the fall where you see everybody throwing their leaves down in the ditch, <laughs> you know, which really helps out a whole lot, but that's what happens. And I think we're at a turning point in James City County where we need to look at things and go, you know what? We have a gold mine here. This is why people are coming. But why are we sitting here ruining it? You know, it's 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 just not good common sense to me. Um you know, is there is there a way to do it and have, you know, have a balance between the two? I think that's what we're looking for is what is the balance? You know, I don't want to go out and look at a, a um, stream that and I and I live on a, you know, section of water and I love it. Love everything that's going on. with. It. Don't want to see it degraded where I see bottles and garbage washing down the, as the tide comes in and out. And um, and, you know, in the money that we've put in to the um, to fix the streams, you know, now we're starting to put more and more since I've been on the board. We're doing more and more and more, which is great for the environment. But we've got the cart in front of the horse. And now we're trying to figure out how to move the cart down the road. And what we need to do is get the horse back in front of the cart where it belongs. So I think that's what I'm, I'm seeing. That's what we need is tools to say, okay, we're not saying no to everything. Right. We're saying as we develop it, people come to this community because of what it is. I want to see this community be a gold mine with the other communities around us. Man, I wish I was there. And um, and this is how we get to, man, I wish I was there. And it may not mean developing the whole community and i'll probably get some calls about that <laughs> what well, is a balance right and it and it has to do with uh the the, the biggest challenge is putting uh, values dollar values especially on those things that are very valuable to you whether it's a stream in your backyard or a clean waterway downstream or fishing or what what have you right um just as much as you can say, well, our taxes would go up by this dollar amount if we let this one development go through, right? So you have to think about how you value those things. And that's the biggest challenge with natural resource valuation is it's hard to put dollars on your stream. Now, you could put a dollar on your stream based on what it's going to cost to restore it later, right. which might, you know, that's a number that you can get easily now, but that's a lot more expensive to restore a stream than it is to just protect or enhance the drainage area that's going to the stream. And it's just a decision that has to be made. Um, and it, and, and it, you know, I live and think in watersheds and, and the dendritic nature of it as I walk and drive the earth that's all i tend to look at but not a lot of people do right that's not something that people think about when they're like i want to buy a house or i want my child to be able to afford to live near me or or something like that so we just it's part of its education part of its getting a better understanding but our job within the watershed management plan is to make sure that we highlight those tools and levers and mechanisms that are proffered by universities, by the Center for Watershed Protection, by other groups, agencies that have done the research that have said this is the thing that works the great, the best for ABC or X, Y, and Z pollutants. And this is the way to avoid the urban stream syndrome where, you know, great, you, you know, 
you're not loading a bunch of sediment, but you pushed all your water into your stream, and therefore, all of a sudden, it's a big, giant ravine, and the banks are sloughing in, right? And I, and I think a lot of people need to understand that that, too, can be affected by the neighbors. We can protect ours, but the neighbor upstream may be doing something in another county that ends up running through ours and, and cost us money. And so it's, you know, they're, they're, your county's doing a lot of development right now. I mean, a ton of development. And, um, you know, there, there's an old um, mill house, or used to be an old mill house back in the 18th century, back over by Marquis, and a pond. And the county minister and I ran through there just to see the development that's going on. And all those streams that are around that development it appears that most of them are going into VMPs and going in there. So it's 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 a lot more impervious cover that's affecting that landscape now than ever was before. And that 18th century mill pond and, and the old mill that used to be there that isn't there anymore is, is a treasure that they're going to end up losing. And that's what I don't want to see in our environment and what we're doing here in James City County. You know, I want to see, okay... How do we work together, but how do we protect the only valuable thing we have is our land? How do we protect our land and make sure we're not abusing it and, you know, just for the almighty dollar? Yeah, the jurisdictional boundaries can be a huge challenge and sometimes end up in litigation. In this case, with power, like I mentioned, you're lucky with these three watersheds that you're not. Like the power is within James City County government and the citizens to make a decision about okay this is what we want our watershed to look at look like in 2040 this is what i want our streams to look at look like at 2040 and beyond so i just very quickly just want to say yeah. um thank you and i also want to thank um supervisor eisenhower for recognizing that it had been so long since we had done that and this and we, we need to make sure that we're on a more consistent schedule. And I know there's a cost to it, but I think it's very important. And I do appreciate the words that my colleagues have said. I think some of it, the ship has sailed. So, you know, the important part is going to be um, moving forward. And I think something that you said too, communication, because it's, it's very, you know, someone may not understand um, the significance of of why this is important, and so um, you know we the pushback. So I think sure. you know that that's that's going to be important on us. And um, I do have to give our staff credit because some of the stream um, restorations that they've done are, are frankly, um, I mean, it's just it's beautiful. It's a shame it had to be done, mm -hmm. um, but they've done an outstanding job doing those. Um, but it is quite costly and um, and the damage done in the meantime um, also so so what's next mm -hmm. in this process so for the Powhatan we're we're in this cycle where we're we're doing a lot of this sort of desktop analysis we call it but we were also in the field the last two weeks with our, our streams team out there doing assessment of streams to give you a finger on the pulse of all the waterways here within the watershed and then starting um, probably not next week, but the following week, uh, we're going to have some engineers and, uh, and another gentleman going around and looking at sort of the neighborhoods and hot spots that we have identified as a part of this and the water quality analysis and other things like age of BMP, number of BMPs, that sort of thing, to help identify actionable items for you on. This is an older development, uh, doesn't have as many BMPs, so... It was built before. These are requirements, regulations, et cetera. These are a lot of retrofit opportunities to uplift the downstream waterways. In other cases, you might have BMPs that were there, but the, the ages, you know, they can also be converted to newer, newer approaches that we've developed in the past couple of decades. Um, so they're going to be out there. Um, I'm, What's the time schedule, Tony? Can you help me? Wow. I've just got all three rolling. So I I've think lost. if you, I don't know how to back up the slide, but you have that on there. And I would just add that right now on the county's website, there is a link where um, citizens can click there it is. to you. do an online survey that's currently out there and will remain open through 
um, most of February, we have um, our first public meeting. And that when you click on the link from the county's website to go take the survey, you'll also see an advertisement on there now announcing our first public meeting for folks to come out. It's gonna be on Monday, February 13th at the James City County Rec Center. Um, I can't remember if it's rooms B and C, B and C. Um, from 6 to 8 p.m. We wanted to have it in the evening so as many folks that want to come and stop by. Um, it's going to be mostly an open house kind of format, but we're going to have our consultants there. Our staff's going to be there. We'll have exhibits. We'll have some um, tablets where folks can do the online survey there at the rec center if they hadn't had a chance to do that yet. So we're just trying to gather public input uh, so that we can move forward with next steps. That, that, that is uh, Monday the 5th. Monday the 13th, 6 to five, uh, six to 8 at the rec center. Correct, okay. yes. Okay, thank you. And so the time, ta so there's there's a couple of cycles where we'll be soliciting uh, feedback from general public, both in person, online, the whole time. There's also some other, you know, specific kind of technical committee meetings we'll be doing too. Um, but, you know, the goal is that we're going to have our, all of our recommendations, everything to them for review and consideration may and okay thank you how <laughs> yeah. like other questions thank you appreciate it very much thank you all very much appreciate it Thanks. and i would i would like to um at this time as, as well tell the citizens that on february 13th 6 to 8 as, as was already stated that if, if you can't come you can go online you can find us a lot of ways put in your two cents and all that. It's like voting. You know, if you don't vote for the person you want to win, then there's no need in coming back later to the board and complaining because you didn't vote. So <laughs> get out there and vote. Good. Roundabout way of saying Good it. Good point. Certainly don't tell us you didn't vote. Yes. <laughs> sure they don't tell us. All right, next we'll uh, move into D, our consent calendar. Today's consent calendar includes the following items. And... Um, Contract award one hundred and fifty thousand three hundred and twenty six for the Veterans Park Outdoor Sports Lighting Upgrade. Uh, grant award for seventy six thousand four hundred and fourteen for for life return to lo localities funding. Grant award for twenty three thousand two dollars for litter prevention and recycling program. Grant award of sixteen thousand for state homeland security program. Grant award for ten thousand for the Virginia DEQ. CBPA support grant for 2023 minutes adoption and resolution of the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Ordinance violation at 206 Crescent Drive. That's so moved. So moved. Aye. Right. Roll call, sir, please. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. McLennan? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Motion carries. All right. Next, we'll move into E, which is ORD-22-0001. Amendment to the Scenic Roadway Protection. Mr. O'Connor. We have Mr. Haldeman as well. Welcome, guys. Thanks for coming out. Good evening, or good afternoon, I guess it's still. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the Board of Supervisors, I'm Tim O'Connor. I'm the chair of your planning commission this year, and I'm here with Mr. Haldeman, who is chairing our policy committee, and also in attendance today is Ms. Null. She's not on the policy committee, but I'm sure she will listen with great detail. So uh, we just want to thank you for the opportunity to speak today about some potential ordinance amendments items to provide you an update on the policy committee's discussion and recommendations, and to seek some feedback from you uh, before we do any further work. Potential ordinance amendments for discussion today are amendments to help achieve protection and preservation of scenic roadways, such as Forge Road, to help retain the character of rural lands. And as you know, there's a GSA in the 2045 Comprehensive Plan specific to this potential ordinance amendment, and the board adopted initiating an initiating resolution in late 2021 to explore implementing this. So Mr. Haldeman has all the heavy lifting today, so I'm going to turn it over to him. But before I do that, just want to thank staff for all the work that they're doing supporting us. They just came out of the comp plan, um, and, and we've been tasking them with a lot of, of maps and presentations so we can make some good decisions here. So, Mr. Haldeman. Thank you, Tim. 
Thank you, and uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, the policy committee met on this issue in August, November, and uh, this month, January. Um, the, the policy committee has so far made several recommendations on how to proceed with various aspects of a potential amendment and hopes to go through those with the board today for, to get some feedback. Um, the first uh, decision we made was how to define a scenic roadway. It's not defined in the comprehensive plan. And um, we came up with these six uh, roads, uh, community character corridors outside the PSA. And the first two, Forge Road and Stage Road, are uh, open agricultural. And the other four, Richmond Road, Monticello Avenue, John Tyler, and River, uh, Riverview, are all wooded character corridors. Options for moving forward regarding this consideration are, Option number one, no additional proposed changes to how scenic roadway segments are defined. That is to say, the, the, uh, uh, the six roadways that I mentioned earlier, um, that will continue to move forward drafting the proposed ordinance for consideration of these roadways. Um, option number two would be to define them differently, in which case we would seek your feedback um, for that. Or, uh, any? Can we, um, or I'm just asking, can we add Dyeskin as number seven to that list? If it's, is it a community character corridor and is it outside the PSA? Our uh, legal staff has said that we, we cannot pick and choose among roadways. It has to be part of a category, a legal category. And so the category in this case is community character corridors outside the PSA. I don't know if it's a. I I'm not. It I, is? It is. Oh. I know it's outside the PSA, but don't know if it's a community character. character. Corridor or considered that. Bring in someone who knows what they're talking Thank about. Thank you. Uh, Sorry he, to mess up everything. <laughs> he answered that correctly. So um, it's not a community character corridor. And as he had said, when we're coming up with a new regulation, we have to apply it uniformly within a category. And so we wouldn't be able to um, pick or add um, roadways that are outside the category of CCC. And that was a discussion and something the policy committee had been interested in doing. Um, but unfortunately, legally, our uh, council had said that that was not advisable. Okay. That answers that question. We had discussed uh, several other roadways, and we couldn't go forward with them for just that reason. So, um, But could we bring those in later as community character corridors? It's Mr. I mean, if you, if you're all yes. saying yes. Everybody's going okay. like this. All right. <laughs> okay. So that's later. So that, that thank can be you, done. sir. Yes. Uh, Could you put those two options back up on the screen again, please? The one and two. There. No. There. So I do have a quick question. If we were to make changes, um, would you please explain, or could someone please explain to the citizens who might have property along these corridors? If any changes were to take place, how that would affect their properties? I, I think you'll see that as, as we go forward on the presentation. Okay. Um, so we, we were challenged on how to protect scenic roadways, mm -hmm. and we have some ideas for that. Okay. Um, and the, but first we have to decide what are scenic roadways. And so this option defines scenic roadways as community character quarters outside the PSA. Once we agree on that, um, we can go forward with the suggestions on how we're going to address protection. And that is the best way that our legal team has said we should define them, correct? Okay, so then I would say uh, for myself, are we doing a straw poll? Option okay. one? So, okay. Yeah. Option three. All right. Thank you. Tim. So the second item we wanted to discuss tonight is which protection tools best fit the intended purpose. 
So the policy committee has considered many potential options for protecting these roadways with the options listed within the, G with the goal strategies and actions LU 6.3, providing the starting point. Options included requiring dedication of scenic easements, minimum lot size changes, increased setbacks and or buffering, overlay districts, and the potential for making a cluster development pattern mandatory for development along these roadways. The policy committee discussed and reviewed all of these options, and at this time, the policy committee recommends pursuing the recommended setback and buffer tools as the option to draft into ordinance form. So we're currently seeking, uh, or we're currently recommending the setback and buffer tool be, tailed, be tailored to each CCC type. As such, the policy committee, and Ms. Sadler, to your point, has been discussing a setback of 400 feet in accordance with the GSA to apply to the open agricultural community character corridors, since the setback of structures protects the viewshed. We would recommend parcels less than 500 feet in depth be exempt from this requirement and that existing structures still be allowed to be expanded. Following analysis of the open agricultural community character corridors, which was included in the board's packet for the setback, the policy committee discussed exempting shallower parcels, those less than 500 feet from the setback, and allowing existing structures to be expanded as long as they don't expand toward the roadway. For wooded CCCs, enhancing buffering for commercial and large residential projects is recommended. The committee is also recommending an update to the buffering provisions in the timbering activity section of the ordinance. Enhanced buffering fits the purpose of the wooded community character corridors, and the policy committee unanimous, unanimously recommended the proposed measures for wooded CCCs. Mr. Alderman. Um, so, with Mr. O'Connor's uh, statements in mind, the options for moving forward regarding this consideration are the following. No additional proposed changes to the proposed preservation tools. In other words, stick with the use of setbacks and buffering as an ordinance amendment tool. Staff and policy will continue to move forward drafting a proposed ordinance for a proposed setback of 400 feet for open agricultural community character corridor scenic roadway segments. Uh, with the two uh, exceptions referenced previously, and an enhanced buffering and a timbering activities buffer requirement for wooded community character corridors, scenic roadway segments. If option number one did not meet with the board's expectations, um, uh, option number two would involve considering a different combination of preservation tools. With additional feedback and input, staff and policy committee will revisit the item. The 500 foot, um, less than 500, it would allow that lot to move the structure forward, pat into the 400? Yeah, an existing structure um, would existing, be exempt. Right. Would be exempt from the 400 foot setback. So if it was already within 400 feet, it could stay there, um, and it could even expand. Uh, you could put an addition on or a, uh, an accessory, but not any closer to the road. Right, which I, I agree. You know, if you're already existing there, you should. But wasn't there, was there something I read in there about if the lot was less than 500 foot, then the 400 foot would not be considered? Is that... That's correct. They would be exempt from the 400 foot. Why, why would that be? It would just take too big a chunk out. We thought it would take too big a chunk out of the property. Okay. So if we're... To have a 400 foot setback on a 500 foot property. That would give you still 100 foot in the back. If it was 5, if it was 410, it'd be hard to do it. Um, Just wondering with the protection of trying to protect that I think what you're what you're looking at is is it it seems to be an all to me and it's either all or nothing so if you've got less than 500 feet with your property if you're saying okay it's going to be exempt now where can the structure be placed on that exempt lot it could be be placed right up to the road right 
Well, it's, the setback is currently 75 feet. 75, okay, so it could, it could come up to 75 feet, right. um, the way you're proposing it right now, uh, as opposed to some other methodology, I, which I guess we, have, you haven't, we haven't talked about. Is you, your recommendation was just, and then the second question for me is, how many parcels, do we, do we know how many parcels fall in that category? We, do, we, we did um, ask that question. There are quite a few along Old Stage Road. Um, far less so on Forge Road, but I don't have the actual figures here. Do you have them, Thomas? We do have the map. <laughs> keep forgetting my voice is not very loud. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, we do have a map that shows here a visualization of the exempt parcels. It's a, a bit tricky to see um, on here, but the, um, the red highlighted parcels here are the ones that, based on our measurements, are less than 500 feet deep. And so these That's would, Ford, right? yeah, yep. this is on Forge Road. So these would have the, continue to have a setback of 75 feet. Two, three. I believe it's around 11 or 12. Uh, I don't have the table 10, in front 10 or 11 of them there, I hope. Yeah. And then for Old Stage Road, you have the same uh, type of map that's showing those exempt parcels. And this is a, a fairly short stretch of road within the county. Um, given the PSA is down towards the bottom. So do, do you take old stage road? That's a lot of mm. exempt. Do you take them out of out of it, maybe? Remove them from, from the requirement? I, if you're talking about this P, right? The, the nude colored lots is. The ones in red. You, right, right, right. But I'm yeah. saying what we're talking about, the other lots are the, are the I'm sorry, that's not nude. I don't know what you would call it. Beige. But, um, that's the 400-foot corridor. Yeah. I mean, that's just, a, okay. It's just a lot of red in there, so. Most of those red already have buildings on them, though, don't yeah. they? Oh, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, the yellow, okay, never mind. Are, are any of those parcels um, grandfathered um, in terms of the subdivision? So, so, you know, they're large. Oh, yeah. Five on the one for three, right? Right, if they're under 25, they could go one for three. Yes, some of them are. I don't have the exact number here today, unfortunately. So I'm trying, I, I mean, I guess I'm trying to figure what happens when you do the subdivision. You know, how many lots are going to be? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm wondering with, with Ford Road. I mean, if I divide it up into 20 acre lots, but I make it so that it's under 500, then do I push it up to the street? So the way that, um, I believe the way staff could write the ordinance would be, let me back up, anytime we get a subdivision plat, we review to make sure that it meets uh, the county ordinances. And part of that is making sure there's a buildable envelope within the parcel itself. And so if, let's say, the 400-foot setback were approved and somebody wanted to come in and subdivide the property, um, we would have to make sure that they're not subdividing the parcel in a way where they're getting around the 400-foot setback. Um, not sure if that addresses your question, but it is something we check during the subdivision review process. Yeah, that's what I would, you know, wonder if, if, I, take, if I can take that 20 acres and, and thin it down at the road and I'm still within my, you know, divided into 20 acres I'm in A1, but now my house is 75 foot instead of 400, like my neighbors. And then that tends, the ones that are there are there. That's that's part of the whole. But the, the biggest thing is, I think, with everybody I've talked to down Ford Road was to try to move it off the road and, um, you know, keep that country feel and that horse feel down that road way so that it gives it a better look. Um, what about now family subdivisions? You know, that goes into smaller lots. Can that family subdivision get up close to the road? So it depends on the way that we would write in terms of the setback when it comes to the lot exemption. 
there's a way we could write the ordinance, I believe, that would say your lot has to have this average depth as of this date. And that would prevent somebody from coming in and then creating a new lot that's right against the road that basically lets them get out of the 400 foot setback. Um, when it comes to the family subdivision question, I'm not sure I have an answer for that today. That's a very good question. And it's something for us to think about. And then I know with, with old stage, there's so much built right in there. It's almost hard to go, okay, my neighbor's right here and I've got a small lot and I've got to be way back here. And with, with Ford Road, you still got that open vista, I think is what we're trying to capture on some of these roads is that open vista so that 50 years from now, you know, it looks similar to what it looks like now. It doesn't look like it's been developed by, uh, well, big company. We won't say any names. <laughs> I, th I think that was the point I was trying to make about old stage is that is is it going to is it going are we just penalizing or is it going to make a difference right that's what i'm thinking I'm, it doesn't look like old stage is going to make a difference in that i mean anytime corner. you open things you make a difference but yeah. um, not to that extreme like four trade yeah be. but that's why i was thinking with diaskin even though now i found out that it because <laughs> it's not much on the road so you know, and it's bigger lots in there. In fact, we have some purchase development right lots in there. So it's, uh, you know, it can be pushed a little and protected for future generations. And so to, to the point raised earlier, you know, some of this feedback would be real helpful because certainly should this piece of legislation be adopted, should that go into place, you know, those lots that are currently existing that have a home on them, uh, you would be able to add to if they were in the 400 feet. As proposed, any new lot that's created that's vacant, you can't have a lot size that is unbuildable because it's all in the setback. So that lot, whoever is laying that out, whoever is subdividing that, who is ever developing that subdivision, would have to make that lot bigger to have a buildable home site that's outside of the setbacks. And that also still perks and still has a well site and alternative and meet all the other requirements. Um, you know, I think you all have long sort of set aside separate regulations for family subdivisions. So, you know, that's a little bit of a break off piece and, and uh, is not necessarily the same as a major subdivision. So, you know, based on the direction of the board, you know, we could certainly look at the family subdivision language to see if that would be included or not. I, I, I still have the, the Concern, one concern about the, the grandfathered properties, which is to say that, you know, when we um, changed the ordinance, yeah. we said basically to these folks, well, you're not affected. Yeah. Right. And if what's really going to happen is that, well, you're not going to have the same 20-acre requirement, but we're going to reduce the number of buildable lots on your property by a certain number, then that is something I think... But for a similar exemption, that that would be an additive piece for those lots that could still subdivide to three acre minimums. Proposed. Do you have um, the other roads like map like this too? Yeah, just these two. Okay. So are you able just to pull one road out and apply it? To um, not. Following the, the categorical rule, it would be both of these because these are the open slash agricultural designated CCC. So it would have to be both. What if it's, if the ones that are already pre-plotted don't follow, it'll only be the new ones coming up. Like on old stage, there's, they're, they're already pre-plotted lots. So they would be exempt? So they would be exempt. It would be any lots that, as of this date, that have not been plotted out. All of them are ones of a, you know, 25 acres or less or 20 acres or more type of thing. Uh-huh. Have to work with the attorney's office to Get see to where we that. can push and pull in that area in that respect, you know? Yeah, because, you know, when you when you look at those those little lots, I mean, they don't look like they're... 20, 25 acres, and um, so those, 
and and most of them i think there's on the view we have right here one two three four this is forge forge right on this right we've got four small lots on forge so you know they may not be able to push back 400 feet on those existing plotted so again, if they have a, if they are currently vacant, and they're less than 500 feet, those would be exempt and would follow the setback currently in place, which is 75 feet. So to help that, would we change that setback from 75 to? Could they do 200? We're certainly happy to go look at that analysis and see, you know. Um, Changing it from the 500 to the 400, what that, how the analysis might change if we went to a 200. And then that would push them a little bit further off the road, but wouldn't jeopardize the lot itself. It but then would you'd just... have to apply that to old stage as well, though, right? Right. right. Again, we'd, we'd look at both and see what that You're just that talking would be. about the lots Small that are exempt. Right. Okay. The others would go to the Four hundred. Right, yeah. That makes sense. Something we can certainly look to analysis on. Look at that and bring that back to us and see how Let's that affects. Think about it a little bit more. See how that would affect everybody. I would like to have them. Can we come back? Can we take care of that? Thank you. Um, staff, I guess we'll we'll do the analysis. I love saying that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, back on y'all. To the next policy committee meeting. Um, uh, we'll have to get back to you on the timing. I'm not sure how long this analysis will take. So, um, at the risk of completely upending all of the options, you know, one of the options that that the committee is not really recommending, if you wanted to select certain parcels or certain roads specifically, and kind of get away from this idea of doing everything categorically. Um, you know, this idea of an overlay district is out there, but you would essentially be doing a county-initiated rezoning of those areas and those parcels that you would want to be doing. And so, you know, the, the categorical definition doesn't require that. So that wasn't part of the recommended scenario today. Mm -hmm. But that, those two scenarios then could be brought back to us and have an option? On these two roads? On, no, For the on, 200? On, on what you just mentioned and what we're looking at today, those two options. Those are separate you than what you just said, ever. on that, yeah. sure. But if we could, you on know, kind of weigh district. the odds and, and, and is that board, do you? Something you'd like when, to have more when you're, on? when you're looking at the, I think there's a certain benefit to staying with the category approach. But when you're talking about, quote, the exception for lots that are less than, you know, 500 feet, um, we're talking about, I, I mean, we, we may be uh, pounding, uh, you know, ants with a sledgehammer here because you're, you've got 10 parcels on one road and Maybe what about a couple of dozen or, or twelve or fifteen or on on the small part of Old Stage Road, um, and just leaving them exempt and letting them build to seventy-five feet. I don't think it's going to make it for, for specifically on Old Stage. I don't think it's going to make a big difference. I mean, take a look at the number of houses that are already there that close. Yeah. Anyway, I don't think, I don't think old it's going to make a big difference. I think it's clear, much cleaner if you just leave the exemption the way it is. Um, you know, um, you know, and, and what I would be more, I would be more concerned about uh, the 75 foot setback on the 10 parcels on, on, um, on old stage road. So, you know, maybe, maybe to just, just to have you take a look at whether, you know, whether there's, um, the benefit or, or a disadvantage of trying to maybe tweak 75 to a hundred or 150 or something like that. I don't, I don't know. Um. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm more inclined to just to stick with what they what they proposed here and have them bring back and show us a little more detail on how the exceptions are going to be impacted. Oh, 
don't have any. I worried about old stage as much because I don't want to jeopardize anyone who's got a lot and and able to. I am concerned about Ford Road, and um, what's the what's the, the relative impact on Ford Road for those exempt properties? But it's gonna. It, it, we can't change one without changing the other. We can't separate right. the two. Not if you do it categorical based on the CCC designation. Okay. So, yeah, you'd be doing a, a zoning. possible rezoning through an overlay district. We what does that have, mean? What does that mean? So we, you know, so for example, down at this end of the county around the airport, we have the airport overlay district that has a supplemental height limit. Those parcels have a separate zoning designation, and so that would be the county rezoning whichever properties you select and adding in some supplemental requirements. If you did an overlay, would you do it on old stage or forge? Uh, categorical, you would have to do both. both, and that would just be a text amendment. We couldn't do just an overlay like we have down at the airport? in the Forge area, Forge Road area? We would need to bring you back some more information on that as part of the analysis. That was something we would uh, want to spend some additional time with with the attorney's office just because of the procedure and implications and everything else. We had some cursory conversations with them early on, um, but that did not bubble up to be a full recommendation, so we sort of paused that work and that discussion pending the discussion today. I would like to see that and possibly if that can be pulled out some other areas as well that may have that same overlay district that we would probably have to look into. Well, with the open, it would really just be this road and old stage. But if we do an overlay, it doesn't limit if we pull the two apart. It doesn't limit if we went down, say, Dyson with an overlay district. It starts to get, you know, sort of blending both at that point. So, you know, let us sort of try to package that up a little bit better for you. And just to see, it may not work. Y'all may go, this does not fit where we're heading. Or this does fit what we're trying to do. I'd like to see that. I think, the, I think the dilemma for me is I don't think the impact is the same on old stage as it is on forge. And I think that's what we're struggling with, trying to figure out. Okay, you've got this here, you've got this here. How do we how do we figure it out for both of them if they're not kind of sort of the same? Totally different. It's totally yeah. different. So that's that's our dilemma, I think. Okay, any other questions? Have we confused y'all enough today? No, we with are. all your hard work that and I appreciate all the hard work and effort that everyone's yeah. put in it. It is great information and um Sorry to go at the last minute and say, hey, can we look at this? But sometimes that happens. Yes, sir. We already have three meetings on it. We, yeah, and that's yeah. why, we're, and that's why I'm go. a little bit hesitant right now to commit to a timeline. Let's sort right. of take all this back. Yeah, that's fine. Are we Figure. finished with this presentation now? Well, I just think I'd like to add, if I could. Yes, um, sir. We had lots of discussion about 100 feet, 200 feet, and um, so I don't think – policy committee is necessarily opposed if we wanted to shrink that up some because at the end of the day at our last discussion if you have a 20 acre lot you square that's almost a thousand feet by a thousand feet so if you're going to have one of the handful of larger parcels a 20 acre lot you're not going to get a whole lot of structures within that 400 foot setback on on these roads so um, so that's an additional protection I think that's built in that we didn't we didn't draw or factor into that discussion but again I think it'll provide for a large setback because you know if it's a hundred acres and you get five lots and you have 3,000 feet you're only going to get three structures towards the front of that parcel and you'll need roads to get to the rear so um, you know, so there's a lot of a lot of additional considerations for you all as well. Okay. Um, be before we conclude, I, I would be remiss. I know we spent a lot of time 
looking at this piece, um, and, and just in the interest of time and brevity, and Ms. Larson, to your point, there was one more supplemental question um, that it might be helpful to get board feedback and direction on now, and that's the issue with the idea of an enhanced setback. Policy committee had a question of, should there be sort of any trade-off, I'll use a, a generic term, sort of benefits back to the property owner? And so the question before you that's sort of supplemental to that setback piece is, you know, in addition to doing some of this additional analysis, do you want staff to spend, before we bring anything back, spend some additional time thinking about what some of those trade-offs or benefits could be, and we'll bring it all back at the, at one, at the same time, or we could return with the setback piece and then figure out those other parts later, maybe in the, over the next year or two as part of a separate work plan. Um, any thoughts or directions on that would be helpful for us as we do a scope of work for this next piece. Can you give some idea about your definition of a benefit? I have no idea what that could be at this point. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a good question. I mean, you know, certainly the, the county has certain programs in place already, right? People can apply for some, some clustering trade-offs. Uh, folks uh, uh, do know about our PDR and open space programs. You know, however, all of those are, um, I, I don't know if any of those can accrue by ordinance or by right. All of those are subsequent discussions and separate discussions and point in time decisions by the legislative body. So uh, it's kind of hard to match up. Well, if you okay. do this, then you automatically get this. It's kind of hard to set up that way. All the programs right now are fairly distinct, and, and you all have the ability to make those decisions uh, one at a time based on the merits of the specific proposal. Um, but it, it's, it's a valid question, an interesting question. I don't have any good ideas for you. So uh, that one would take some time for us. Yeah, I'd certainly be willing to consider some some uh, potential benefits to, uh, to folks who are impacted by this. Um, I think it is going to be challenging, though, because when we think about things like uh, the um, uh, PDR program, uh, we're going to have a set of criteria that uh, um, probably won't make that a priority. Uh, so it's, uh, with limited funding uh, to try to uh, accomplish significant impact. I don't and you, know. you know, if you if you think about it, if if I can build 75 foot to the road, but now I have to build 400 feet, I've got to put more gravel, more driveway in. I've got more power to go in and that sort of thing that maybe, you know, that might be the cost that we look at as far as, okay, at that time, maybe there's a fund that I, I could be 75, and this would be an attorney thing, may get into deep water with it, but, um, you know, and you're requiring me to be 400 feet. Well, who's going to pay for the rest of that driveway? Maybe it's a one-time thing that, okay, we pay for the, the power, the cable, and the driveway at X amount is a amount you receive if you want to do, you know, a driveway of concrete or asphalt or something. That's up to you, but a gravel driveway to this point would be. And, you know, compensate for pushing those houses off the road. You know, I would. I mean, certainly in the more traditional sense, the trade off has been an increase in density. But, mm -hmm. you know, to do that sort of short of the legislative process for what would otherwise be applicable in a buy right scenario would be the expectation of that buy right density increase. So offset that cost by instead of being able to do one home, now I can do two. I think um, we'd but, you be know, more that, interested in a driveway. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> so, but, you know, that, that's definitely a more complex discussion and path than you all originally sent us on with the initiating resolution. Yeah. And I want to state it a 1 to 20 as okay. where we're at. That's important to I'll make I'll make staff cringe. So, um, it, you know, it, for for me and for at least one of my colleagues on the on the policy committee, um, we just felt this was a little bit of a at least I felt this was a little bit of a of a cart before the horse because we're, we're talking about the scenic roadway piece from from the one to twenty. So we're reducing 
developable area, if you will. And then we're also considering um, the net developable area and what those impacts are. So, um, you know, and, and what the cumulative impacts are, you know, on on some of the larger parcel holders. So that's sort of the, the hurdle I've been trying to, to get over, if you will, so. I, I can I can see, you know, understand that that piece, but as a whole, I think it'll work better in the long run as a whole for everyone. So, so we have some additional work to bring you back in terms of analysis and Again, just to kind of put a fine point on it, sounds like for now the board might be at option B, which is we kind of want to get the setback piece figured out, and then we may revisit some additional sort of trade-off elements in, at a later time. The board. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate Thank it. Thanks much. Mm -hmm. Great presentation. All right. I want to say thanks for the opportunity to, to be here today and get the feedback, and uh, I think we have our marching orders, so thanks much. Congratulations on your position. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. We don't have anything under board considerations, board requests, and directives. Um, yes, ma'am. For our, our friends from the PC leave. <laughs> um, Here's some more work. Get your pencils out. Uh, I have some serious concerns over vape and smoke shops in James City County, and I've asked Paul if he would talk about how we can address these issues. Mr. Holt, please, if you would. Afternoon again, Afternoon. Mr. Chairman. Members of ours can be a busy 2023. <laughs> <laughs> Put your roller skates on. It's, uh, it's okay. Uh, I live with them on. I mean, it just makes no, it easier. Do. It saves me the time of taking them off. Um, again, thank you very much. So in anticipation of Ms. Sadler's inquiry, you have at your space today a little bit of a cover memo. Um, so certainly the best way to address that concern would be to look at possible amendments to the zoning ordinance. Right now, smoke shops and vape shops are allowed in most of our zoning districts by right. And just by analogy, I think there was uh, headline in the paper a couple days ago as well where the city had moved some of those to be a special use permit which of course as you know gives you all as the board some legislative ability to consider those on a site-by-site -site basis so um, again just in, in anticipation of today's discussion uh, on the back side of that cover memo is a proposed resolution it's an initiation of consideration of amendments to the zoning ordinance to consider possible amendments regarding the use list of the limited business LB, general business B1, limited business industrial, which is our M1 district, plan unit development, mixed use and economic opportunity, EO, and the residential planned community districts to require that vape and smoke shops obtain a special use permit. Again, this is an initiating resolution only. It directs staff in the policy committee to kind of go off and do that work and bring those back to you for a future public hearing. Um, so if that's adopted, that's what this would do. And um, as the board may want to, we're happy to start that work. Questions? Well, I'd like to make the motion to approve the resolution. We have a motion on call. We'll call please. Uh, Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Ripple? Aye. Motion carries. Oh, one more question. Um, just think about it as we were eyeing. The, um, will, what does that do to any vape shop in the process of moving into a new building while we're considering that? Will that put a freeze on that till this is considered or? No, um, that, you know, if they're already in at whatever point the ordinance is adopted, they would become non-conforming. And much like any of our other non-conforming uses, that the expansion of non-conforming uses is governed by the ordinance. So they would not be able to expand unless they came into compliance and got in a special use permit. What if they're not in and maybe in a uh, three weeks, they decide to move into a structure and, and start a vape shop and they get everything they need license and all that while this is going on and we're deciding that 
is that something that they would have to stop or they could still move in? They could still move in. Again, it's, it's whether or not they would be in prior to adoption of the change in the, in the county code by the board. Okay. And then that would, it, at that time, they would be considered legal operating. And then once we, if, if this board changed it, after consideration for planning commission advise us on items if we changed it what happens to that person that's already operating a shop sure it becomes legally non-conforming at that point and they can continue as is they just could not expand without coming and getting a special use permit okay but they could operate as they are but in a limited what they have right now Okay, thank you. Just, just, to, just to, to yes, give another example of, of uh, something that might occur. So let's say that uh, the va a vape shop operates for some period of time as a legally non-conforming use, closes, is replaced by another business. A vape shop could not then come in after that. Is that right? Uh, non-conforming use after two years of vacancy. After two years of vacancy. Yep. What, uh, now, vacancy being the same as rotating out? So, you know, if, if one owner vacated and then a different tenant, but with the exact same product line, moves in six months later, they could continue. If, it, if you know, that storefront becomes vacant for, or, or that use is gone for a, and, and it changes to, um, you know, flowers. Mm -hmm. You know, they change, it's got to be two years, and then that, they, they can't go back. So if that flower shop is there two years, it's kind of considered vacant from the original use? Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. I think Mr. Haldeman knows a lot He'll about vape, so we should be in good hands, <laughs> I think. It'd be one of the easiest things we do all year. So. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very um, much. Yes, sir. Um, I'd like to, uh, uh, since we have our planning commission folks here, I'd like to see if we could maybe... Uh, uh, you know, we've talked earlier about the uh, current process they're going through with the uh, ordinance for uh, doing uh, residential density based on uh, net developable as opposed to um, gross. Um, and I, I think there was, uh, there was some question about uh, wanting to come back to us for uh, maybe clarification. So I would like to try to, if we can, provide some net clarification at this meeting because uh, I've had discussions with most of the board members, and I think we're still all pretty much in agreement that this is a very high priority item for us. We really would like to have it uh, come to us as promptly as possible, um, and with uh, with due respect for their their process, um, you know, I don't I don't want to shortstop the process, but I do uh, would uh, would like the board to basically uh, reiterate that. Uh, uh, this is we are looking for an ordinance that essentially does uh, transition us to a net developable uh, density and that uh, I know that their policy committee uh, has pretty heavy commitments for CIP in February but I would urge them to try to get the that process through the um, policy committee as promptly as they can uh, preferably in, fe in February because even at that process we have to go through to get it through the Planning Commission and get it back to us and everything is going to take us well into uh, um, potentially as late as, as June and so um, I'm, I'll, I'll open it up to my fellow uh, board members because we've all had con uh, con uh, conversations about this and, I, and we all feel I think that it's uh, very important for us to move forward on this in a fairly expeditious manner uh, but I wanted to make sure that if there were any questions from the uh, Planning Commission or the, or the Policy Committee for us specifically about that uh, I would prefer that we open it up to, to, to add, let them ask that now um, so that we can make sure that they have clear understanding of what our guidance is. So. Chairman. <laughs> Glad you got the position. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> um, I, think, I think we're clear. I don't think staff needs any additional direction. I think we understand what the expectation is and um, clearly this has been part of the discussion with the Forge Road and the Stage Road and the Community Character Corridor. So um, I'll, I'll confer with Mr. Holt and we'll get back to you on timing, but it's, we certainly understand that's one of our primary uh, missions at the moment. And please, please understand that I, this is no, not in any way an attempt to try to 
forestall your debate or your negotiations because what I fully expect to come back is I fully expect to hear uh, the pros and cons and uh, the folks who are for it or against it and why. Uh, I think that's important information for us to have in ultimately making a decision. But I think that the general consensus that we need to understand is this is pretty much where we're headed and uh, we might need that valuable information to make tweaks, but uh, we want to do it in a more timely manner. Sure. I, I understand. I okay. think that um, I, I think based on cumul you know, our discussions about cumulative impacts and the water stu watershed studies and the like, we, we understand the implications and how all these dovetail to each other. So, Thank you. Mr. Haldeman? Uh, I, I just wanted to mention that the policy committee did discuss this at its January meeting. That was the second half of the meeting. Um, and staff provided us with a lot of information as, as they want to do. And um, it, we had a lively, lively conversation about it. Um, the only two questions that we were hoping to get answered uh, from the board is, again, if, if a, a landowner lost significantly significant amounts of developable land, should there be some kind of a compensation scheme involved with that? And also, what specifically is meant to be accomplished um, by any change in the density calculations. There are, staff provided us with the pluses and minuses to Mr. Eisenhower's question um, of, the, of the four uh, calculation schemes that are generally um, used. Um, staff provided us with uh, input from five or six other counties on how they do it, and they all do it differently, um, <laughs> yeah. uh, which is fine. Um, so that's it. That's the only. That's the only guidance. And I, I think one of the concerns that I that I had was uh, in, in trying to draw comparisons around the state. Um, we were a, even a little more unique than I thought we were. I didn't know that until we asked the ask, uh, until I asked the question about what percentage of the county is not developable, and it's about thirty five percent is not developable. So you know that basically one out of every three acres is uh, you, you can't build there anyway. And as uh, Michael and I were talking about the other thing, he's got some really good prime property he'd like to build on, but it's underwater. <laughs> so you know, I mean, the, the question: what, what what really is what really is developable? Um, I, I think the, the the key for me was there are always some ex extenuating circumstances um, where you have a person a piece of property that maybe is eighty five or ninety percent not developable. It's mostly wetlands. You have one small piece of property, and clearly that if you just use the even some portion of that other part you're going to get a whole lot more intense development on what is actually developable when you wash it against the the whole the whole area um, and I, I think ultimately um, you know, pockets of high density like that that are caused by an anomaly in the system were not what we were looking for we were looking to try to to try to uh, um, look at the density more in in terms of really what can you build on so that that was that was um, sort of the, the the gist behind it all i think too was you know our thought process is you know that that we allow this density in this area that may not be able to support the density mm -hmm. but since you've got all this area around you can't build on but now we've put an impact back on the environment, and now we've got to go back and fix these streams and fix this. So we're, we're benefiting maybe a small group of people, but then we're taking the funds from the citizens and saying, okay, now that we've allowed this and we've allowed extra building on here, now we need your funds in order to repair the damage that was done. And that's where I think we were having the hardest time going, well, it's really not fair as a whole, understand, okay, that that this person may not be to develop as intense as they wanted to, but if they do, what that does is put it on the back of the citizens that are existing here, having to pay for the restorations of the streams and everything else that, that caused this issue. So, you know, it, it's if I had 100 acres of flat land and I could build X and I have 20 acres of flat land, but 80%, 80 acres are in restoration or streams and that's why, and we can both build the exact same amount, 
it just puts too much pressure on this. So I think we were looking at what can we build, what can we do, what doesn't cause us to put more money in our streams and more money in restoration and, and allow this one to do what it needs to do and develop at this density, but maybe not give credit to the other one that can't have the same amount of land mass in order to develop. Let me, let me throw one other thing out for people's consideration too. And this, you know, we always, you always look back at decisions made by a previous board. And when the previous board did the new town uh, and said, we're going to examine each of these sections at one at a time as we come forward, it was a great, great process. The net result was with the blob master plan, even with some degree of specificity, we got to where there's a residual parcel in Newtown that we're going to put 104 units on, less than two acres. That's 50 units an acre. That's completely off the charts. But now, if you go back and look at all of Newtown and you count all the open, you know, other, other, other it, it, it doesn't look that bad. It looks good on paper until you live next to it. So that's, that's what I'm, I'm concerned about, creating pockets of ultra-high density that have, as you say, have an adverse impact upon the, 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 the citizens, the neighborhood, the, the environment, everything. Um, so that, that it, get, it still gives us the ability, when we're looking at rezonings, to say, you want more density there? Show me, show me how it benefits the citizens of the, of the county. We can do that. We can, we can approve higher density. Right now, it seems to be because it's in the ordinance at a certain way, it seems to be viewed as a matter of by right. And that's what I, I, I'm concerned about. That's it? That's it. I just want to appreciate it. I think, I think no everybody problem. understands. Thank you. Yes, sir. A couple of quick things, if, if I could. I um, uh, just wanted to mention that I attended the uh, NAACP's AXO uh, luncheon a uh, week ago Sunday and uh, was very impressed with the, uh, the program uh, and uh, the actions that, or the the the, the functioning that uh, NAACP does in supporting uh, our young people in the community who have uh, academic and athletic and uh, um, artistic talents. Uh, also attended a Grove community meeting on January 16th, where we talked about a range of issues affecting the community, and uh, then on uh, Thursday of last week. Uh, along with Supervisor Larson, uh, Assistant County Administrator Reinheimer, and uh, County Attorney Kinsman. Uh, we attended Local Government Day, sponsored by uh, BML, the Virginia Municipal League, Virginia Association of Counties, and uh, the Virginia Association of Planning District Commissions uh, for a Local Government Day. Uh, in, in the process of that, uh, uh, Mr. Kinsman, Mr. Reinheimer, and I uh, visited with our legislators. Uh, Ms. Larson was uh, uh, attending Board of Director meetings uh, for uh, VACO at the time, as she is the um, second vice president. First uh, vice president. First vice president. First, I'm sorry, first vice president. Not that it matters. <laughs> yes. Does of, of VACO. I'm not worried. Uh, now, and uh, uh, um, uh, the three of us met with uh, uh, Senator uh, Mason, delegates Batten, and Mullen. Uh, the issues that, uh, that we raised with them in particular included uh, the um, need to have local government uh, uh, actively involved in any discussions about affordable housing, uh, recognizing that one size does not fit all and communities have to have the ability to accommodate uh, uh, the objectives that they share with everyone else about uh, making sure affordable housing uh, is uh, available to, to citizens. Uh, but that it has to be done in the way that is consistent with the community. Uh, we also talked about short-term rentals and uh, legislation uh, that is designed to, to override local uh, zoning ordinances and uh, uh, neighborhood uh, proffers and the like, uh, and uh, uh, pointed out that uh, uh, short-term rentals can, in fact, become a competitor to the goal of achieving affordable housing. Uh, talked about uh, the restoration of some SOQ support personnel uh, to the state budget in order to uh, recognize the state's responsibility uh, for covering some of those costs, as well as 
uh, encouraging the uh, s uh, legislature to provide uh, additional funding for an increase in teacher salaries uh, as opposed to bonuses. Uh, Mr. Kinsman uh, um, has been uh, actively involved in legislation to um, uh, make the uh, cost and uh, timing of public notice ads in newspapers uh, less onerous, uh, and uh, there is a consensus around that now that seems to be moving forward. We did talk to them about supporting that legislation, and Assistant County Administrator uh, Reinheimer uh, uh, made a uh, uh, an appeal for support for additional funding for uh, police academies in, in the Commonwealth. So uh, we've appreciated very much the attention and involvement of our legislators in uh, those questions, and it was a good opportunity to address any concerns or questions they might have about what local government is doing. And finally, later that day, uh, I chaired a meeting of the Coalition of High Growth Communities. Uh, we again talked about affordable housing and uh, efforts to restrict local government to, uh, uh, decision making in that area uh, and uh, also talked about uh, the importance of uh, examining the question of infrastructure and the ability of high growth communities in particular to address infrastructure needs. Uh, we had about 25 individuals in attendance, about a dozen localities uh, and a very lively and, pro and uh, helpful discussion. Uh, and we look forward to continuing in that regard. So that's it, Mr. Chairman. And I heard you uh, stood up very well for us, and I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> cool, John. <laughs> it's, it's easy to defend James City County. Thank you, sir. Yes, uh, ma'am. Very quickly, I, I attended um, with uh, Mayor Pons and uh, Tom Shepard from uh, York County. Uh, we... Uh, did a presentation question and answer to um, the lead class, the chamber lead class down at York County. Um, also had our uh, Visit Williamsburg uh, meeting last week. We got some very good news on visitor spend and, and visitation. We hope that we will finish uh, 2022 in a better spot than 2019, which was the best this area had seen since 2007. So um, we are making some headway. Uh, did go to Legislative Day, um, and um, along those same lines, um, if I could, I'd like as, to ask Mr. Kinsman, uh, though Supervisor McLennan did an excellent job, I just feel like Thank I just teed him right up, yeah. <laughs> um, to, to give us a, an update on where we are with, with um, some legislation and where, what we need to be watching um, and particularly the short-term um, rental bill that he mentioned, maybe you could explain exactly what, what that does, and then I just have one follow-up when Mr. Kinsman's finished. Thank you, Ms. Larson. Members of the board, I've provided to you um, what is my list of the bills to watch in this session. I tried to break them up into the categories that at least made sense to me. Uh, I won't go through them. Um, uh, one by one because there's 20 pages of it. Even though this is a short session, they've, they've been very busy and there's a lot of legislation out there. Um, sort of big topics, you've got cannabis. They're still trying to figure out uh, really what to do with that in terms of the retail sales. I don't know that you're going to see much go through there being it's a, a divided General Assembly. Um, I lumped a lot of it into finance and tax, and there's a lot of real estate tax exemptions um, that, that have come around, and I just, I'll have that more for Sharon's group if anything gets through on that that we need to watch out for. A lot of changes in FOIA. There are at least one really kind of good bill that, if you recall from a couple of years ago, they loosened up FOIA a little bit to allow electronic meetings for sort of more uh, lower level committees and groups, but they didn't allow that for the, the Board of Supervisors and Planning Commission. There's at least one bill out there that would have let you do that. Um, from a land use perspective, I'll say that at the beginning of this General Assembly, I think we heard that, uh, maybe from the governor directly, that they were going to be looking at forcing local governments to, uh, or at least taking over some of our ability to regulate land use when it came to affordable housing. Basically saying the affordable housing problem is the local government's fault, we're going to take over and make it better. Uh, I didn't see any of those bills come through this year, but what you do see uh, are really a number of bills that have local governments reporting certain things to the Commonwealth. And I think that's probably a, a prelude to what's going to happen in future years. So if you look, uh, and I'm trying to, to sort of separate those out, 
Um, if you look around page seven, page eight, you have House Bill 1671 that, that we report how many fees we get uh, from land use cases. Uh, House Bill 2046, uh, they come out and figure out what statewide housing needs assessment. House Bill 2494, we have to report uh, on our various development. Uh, Senate Bill 1190, we report on zoning information. So I think what you're seeing through this General Assembly is they're going to start amassing information. And I think you're going to see perhaps a more uh, thorough, more well-reasoned bill from the governor next year. So this is the year of reporting. I think next year is the year we'll start seeing some, some action from the state government. Ms. Larson brought it up. We do have a number of short-term rental bills. I think that was promised to us in the past uh, General Assembly, and those have come about. Uh, pages 9, 10, 12, you'll see some of those. House Bill 2103 is a really good one. Um, that one allows us to do sunsetting for um, uh, short-term rentals. And that sunsetting by owner, sunsetting by uh, majority ownership of the business, sunsetting by property sales, sunsetting by time. So that's all a really good thing. That's the one good one. Then there's a bunch of other ones uh, that have, if a realtor uh, runs that Airbnb, then you lose control over it. Uh, there's a few of them that way that, that basically take local control away from uh, short-term rentals. Now, I'm sorry, when you say lose control, are you saying that basically a if a realtor is managing the property, it could go, I, I, we won't speak to the, the, the um, like mandatory HOAs, which is a, mm -hmm. we don't get into them, but you, but you could um, put in a short-term rental next door to someone regardless of, of anything that we have had in place so far. At least from the local government standpoint, yes, ma'am. So if you look, for example, I've highlighted the one on page 12, that would be Senate Bill 1391, there's a companion house bill in there. Uh, it says the locality can't restrict by ordinance any short-term rental property managed by a Virginia realtor. Uh, we can't enforce an ordinance against the property where the ordinance prohibits short-term rentals, limits occupancy, limits the number of days in a calendar year, requires an owner to occupy it for any number of days, uh, any remote monitoring device, interior or exterior inspections, repairs, renovations. So really, it says if, if a realtor is running that property, you've got to treat it just like any other property. So that's any of our regulations. I don't know how that would affect an, an HOA. But really, as we've talked about with our legislators, the, the, not the majority, but a huge chunk of the county allows Airbnbs as a matter of right. Uh, and that includes our R4 district. So that's a lot of our larger neighborhoods where the county is enforcing uh, a special use permit or legislative action on, on short-term rentals, it's where there's not a mandatory HOA. And effectively, the board is stepping in as the HOA and saying, we're going to look and determine whether or not that short-term rental is appropriate in that particular neighborhood. Those would be the ones that are most affected by these bills. So there are companion ones. There's one in the Senate and one in the House. They've not been voted on yet, so I can't tell you, you know, what's going to happen with that. But this is a short session. It's 45 days. So we're going to know about a vote on one of these in a week or so. Thank you. And then lastly, really the big chunk of things are there's a number of bills regarding Virginia retirement system. And I think that's the General Assembly trying to figure out a way to modify the VRS to allow people to come back. And at least one of those bills uh, eliminated the 12 month wait for a one month wait, which would, I understand really help us out. So there's a number of those as well. So really sort of land use, short term rentals, VRS, um, there's a number of miscellaneous ones, and I, I brought this up earlier. There is one that I thought you'd find interesting, uh, a House joint resolution to amend the Constitution to put term limits on you guys, uh, among others. So uh, it would be a three-term limit, so uh, at least affect a few of you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anything further, Ms. Larson? No, um, just would ask that possibly at our next meeting, if you could bring another update, I'd really appreciate it. No problem. Once the list is created, it's really easy to keep it up. So. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And then just my last thing, um, <laughs> I, I've been meaning to ask to speak to this for a while. I, if I if we could get some information on planning commission and what they're paid, when was the last time that they had a um, increase in what they are paid? Um, I believe it's been a while, and um, so I'd like to look into that, please. Thank you. Could be some. Maybe they go with us as far as. You know, as we move staff, they move at the same rate. I don't know if legally if that's, you know, like what we're doing so that we don't have to keep coming back and 
and going over this, we just keep up with it so that they know at least that, hey, we're we're getting that three more cent this year than we had last year. Sure. Okay. Especially if we right. keep bringing them back to all these meetings. Yeah, yeah, they're killing them. <laughs> Pay for your gas, maybe. <laughs> Mr. Yeah. Chair, I had one more item if yes, Ms. Larson is finished. Go right ahead. Um, I've received some complaints about the ongoing construction uh, with the solar farm back in Norvalia. I'm just wondering if staff might have an opportunity to make sure that they're uh, following the guidelines and of uh, with noise and traffic and dump trucks and everything goes on, making sure they're coming in at the um, the, in the area that they were supposed to and not going through the neighborhood. There's a lot of people that are complaining. Um, and I just wanted uh, to make sure that citizens know that we're monitoring what's going on out there. Apparently there's a lot of earth shaking happening. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. All right. The, um, Let's see, the county administrator and I did the uh, mayors and chairs here just recently, and um, everything's going well there. We did talk about what we're doing in James City County and, and some possibilities, and um, one of the things we talked about was um, possibly monitoring with our police department all on, on traffic and things that go through our area and through the other areas and how we can all join together in order to know that if one of our officers go to a scene and there's there's – information out there that can track certain things and one of our officers go to a scene, it may be other individuals around that area that are known to be of um, little trouble. And our officers will know ahead of time that I'm not just dealing with this, but I'm dealing with possibilities down the road of this, this, and this. So it gives us a little bit better. And it's it's out there. It's, it's something that... Um, Possibly we can work with Camp Perry and, and look at possible ways of setting something up and they can train on one side and we can work on the other in order to track some of this activity so that all the way down the peninsula we all are sharing everything that's going on. So in, instead of having to call and check on something, it's, it's instant. And some of that's already going on in some of our other localities. Um, um, went to the PDC and TPO, and, and the uh, gap now is, is funded. Still got some process to go through, but we needed another $151 million. We ended up with $161 million to fill that gap. So we filled the gap, and we're also applying for another $25 million to add on to that because the way costs are escalating, we'll probably eat that up as well. So hopefully that will come into the paper here shortly. We'll get to know something about it. There, of course, with all the projects going on right now, they're about 40 million short, and Croker and Route 60 are in the middle of this shortness of, of funds, and, and everybody, of course, is finding out projects are starting to cost more. So, you know, we really, I really made sure that James City County is in the forefront. These are projects we need. These are projects that are important to our community. And we need those fully funded in order to get those moving and get them back on track. So, and then I think, Paul, you had a meeting the very next day to go over the same thing. So we're trying to pound them on all directions. And other than that, that was all for this little bit of time. Mr. County Administrator, I think you have a report for uh, us, sir. Mr. Chair, members of the board, I do want to share you. Several of you had concerns when, from your, your uh, constituents about Verizon service issues. Just want to follow up. We have been reaching out our staff to their staff. We do have a meeting set up with some of their technical staff to talk, I think, more about some of the things that are going on with, within their systems. I hope we have at least some better explanation in a few weeks for you. In the meantime, again, specifics help. They continue to say where, what, when, describe what was occurring. So as you hear those things from people, it would be nice to know it was Monday at 2 o'clock and this is what wasn't working. And calls were dropping. Any of those specifics you can get within the next week or so and just share with me. Uh, that would be very helpful for us when we meet with Verizon to sort of have more of those kind of instances where we're losing service. And those you've already shared, we've relayed, but if you have other areas where service drops or times of day, things of that nature that you're hearing from the community, uh, we'll relay that as well. Last Tuesday on my way home from the board meeting, <laughs> on 64, three calls dropped. I don't I'm know what time we finished. When I cut the phone on to when I cut it off. It's just a short period. Driving through my neighborhood on any given day. <laughs> All right. I need a motion to go into closed session. Um, um, 
consultant with legal counsel employed or retained by a public body regarding specific legal matters requiring provision of legal advice and such counsel specified regarding unsolicited proposals and the Virginia Public Procurement Act, the acceptance of certain types of proffers as part of a request to zone real property and three, discuss a, a proposal amendment to the A1 and the A a1 and the R8 zoning district pursuant of section 2.2-3711A8 of the Virginia Code and also consideration of personal matter, the appointment of individuals to county boards and commission pursuant of section 2.2-3711A1 of the Code of Virginia and um, for the Williamsburg James City County uh, Community Action Agency reappointment. Mr. Chairman, I'll be happy to move that with an amendment that we take a five-minute break before we go yes, into that closed session. Did yeah. I miss something? Do we not have – Did I, now it's very possible that I missed the um, – regarding unsolicited proposals. Did we do that one? I'm so sorry. So sorry. That's all right. Thank you for keeping me on track. No, no I – yeah, I need I'll, somebody to keep me on track. I'll, I'll miss it every now. All right. Okay. We have a motion to go into the closed session. Uh, Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Ripple? Aye. Motion carries. All right.
Is that a closed session? Mr. Mr. Chairman, I move to certify that we only spoke about those items we indicated we would speak about. Thank you, sir. Ms. Stevens, call roll, please, sir. Uh, Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. McLennan? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Motion carries. All right. Mr. Eisenhower? I would move that we uh, appoint Ms. Tijuana Golson to a uh, uh, the four-year term to the uh, Community Action Agency. I believe the dates were listed on the agenda. I have a motion on the floor. Roll call, please, sir. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. McLennan? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Motion carried. I have a motion to accept the unsolicited proposal received from Henderson and Gilbane for a co consolidated government center and follow the PPEA process in posting the required notice and invite other companies to provide proposals within 120 days. Thank you. Roll call, sir. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. McLennan? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Motion carries. All right. Next thing we'll do is we'll move into adjournment until 5 p.m. on February 14th, Valentine's Day, 2023. <laughs> For, oh. for a regular meeting. Motion. So, uh, motion. Roll call, sir. Ms. Sadler. Aye. Mr. Eisenhower. Aye. Mr. McLennan. Aye. Ms. Larson. I wondered how I was going to spend that day. Aye. <laughs> Mr. Hipple. Aye. Aye. We're done. Thank you.